The committee will come to order. Uh, good morning, and thank you all for joining today's hearing entitled The Danger China Poses to American Agriculture. After brief opening remarks, members will receive testimony from our witnesses today, and then the hearing will be open to questions. Uh, we will, uh, traditionally, we don't do questions with our panels of, of our colleagues. Uh, but I know uh, 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 Governor Nome was interested in taking a few questions. Time-wise, I'm not sure we're going to be able to do five minutes, a uh, full five-minute round uh, with the governor. Um, uh, and the second second panel will be uh, five minutes questions as, as normal. Uh, so good morning and thanks to all for being here for a timely and necessary conversation about threats China poses to American agriculture. Uh, the People's Republic of China, um, governed by the Chinese Communist Party, which is where the, the threat comes from. It doesn't come from individuals. Uh, it, this is imposed basically where we're looking at uh, links to the Chinese Communist Party. has gone out of its way to reduce its reliance on agri uh, agric American agriculture, all while aggressively pursuing tactics that threaten our nation's ability to feed itself. Now, these threats are multifaceted, strategic, and incendiary, and require a coordinated and a proactive response. Uh, these last few years have seen China steal U.S. intellectual property, hack critical cybersecurity and related infrastructure, weaponize agricultural trade, and acquire American farmland at an alarming rate. Uh, each of these disrupt our national security, our rural communities, and our resiliency. Now, China has long used its legal and regulatory system to steal intellectual property, and we have seen this in everything from semiconductors to seeds. Uh, not to mention the scale and the sophistication um, by which China can manipulate critical inf infrastructure has exposed vulnerabilities in American technologies. Now, this interference has ranged from data breaches and theft of agricultural research to ramping up dis disruptions of irrigation and transportation systems. In 2022, Chairman Comer and I, with more than 125 of our Republican colleagues, asked the Government Accounting Accountability Office to evaluate foreign investments in U.S. farmland and its impact on national security, trade, and food security. As many of you know, in 2021, the Department of Agriculture estimated that foreign investments in U.S. agriculture land grew to nearly 40 million acres. A few months ago, we, we received the final report which showed Congress where gaps exist in our reporting framework and how better, more timely coordination between federal agencies could help increase visibility into potential national security risks related to foreign investment. Congress took a natural uh, first step with the recent passage of the Consolidated Appropriations Act, where the bill addressed foreign ownership of land by improving the tracking system of it. Uh, the fact China imports almost as much food as the U.S. exports to the whole world uh, makes this conversation more difficult. In recent years, the U.S. has seen record export values to China for soybeans, corn, beef, uh, chicken meat, tree nuts, and sorghum, all of which are major contributors to our domestic farm economy, underscoring the importance of expanded market access and market diversity elsewhere. So. How do we strike the balance, protecting our producers and consumers in every piece of agriculture value chain while keeping pace with China's needs? How do we reduce our reliance on one country without undermining the necessity of a strong export market? How do we think smartly about policies that mitigate threats while protecting our best assets? Today's witnesses come to the table with lived experience and decades of knowledge on China and these very questions. Now, I welcome each of you and look forward to the discussion. Uh, with that, I, I now like to uh, welcome the distinguished ranking member, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott, for any opening remarks he would like to make. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, the purpose of today's hearing is to discuss the influence that China has on American agriculture. But unfortunately, some of the rhetoric surrounding this topic may derail us from tackling the real issues at hand and may contribute, hopefully not, but may contribute to violence against Asian Americans. 
And I want all Americans to know that we on the Agriculture Committee condemn all bigotry, including race-motivated threats and acts of violence. This is about agriculture policy, not people policy. I also want us to keep in mind that China is an important trading partner to the United States, and we need a thorough and policy-heavy conversation so that we can help the American farmers and our agricultural system navigate this difficult, challenging, and somewhat thorny issue. I will, and I hope everyone here today will engage in a serious, fact-minded, fact-based conversation and avoid fear-mongering and alarmism. Though I'm told that this isn't the topic of this hearing, I am also pleased that the recently enacted Agriculture Appropriations Bill will help USDA update its outdated system of tracking foreign agricultural land ownership in the United States of America. And if we are going to have a serious discussion about foreign influence on American agriculture, we must remember that China is our largest trade partner, accounting for $33.7 billion in U.S. agricultural exports just last fiscal year alone. American farmers are the most efficient and productive, and because of this, we produce far more than we Americans can consume. My colleagues will often note that we are in an agricultural trade deficit right now. And I'm here to tell you that alienating our trade partners will only deepen that deficit. American farmers need large markets to export their products. And when those markets are lost, who does it harm? Our farmers and then the American people. We saw the implications of this when the, uh, the Trump administration started a trade war with China, creating chaos and undermining markets for our American farmers. And since the trade war shut American farmers out of China, guess what? Brazilian farmers have filled that gap, increasing their exports to China as our market share decrease. Now Trump is calling for a 60% tariff on all Chinese goods. This would have drastic impacts on American agricultural production. It would increase costs for consumers and would almost certainly lead to devastating retaliatory tariffs place on the U.S. agriculture exports. So I think it's fair to think that the U, uh, U.S. being so dependent on a single export market, who is also a strategic competitor, raises and poses a risk for our American farmers. And one way that we can address this concern is to expand trade in existing markets while we open new markets. And I continue to support increasing the market access program. That's the way to go. And foreign market development program in the Farm Bill. And I believe that this new, new trade deal are critical for our American agriculture. However, there are many places where I am very critical of the Chinese government, the theft of seed and other agriculture technology is highly concerning to me and continues to be a problem. Market distortion through domestic price support programs and ignoring WTO decisions 
hinders access and creates an uneven playing field for U.S. farmers. And I also remain highly critical of any foreign government seeking to buy American land near essential intelligence or our military installations. This is now a major national security. We must protect our national security interests. This is a national security issue of soaring magnitude to this nation. We got to protect our farmland and not get it in the hands of foreign interests, particularly China. I look forward to hearing from our witness uh, chairman today and coming out of this hearing with an improved understanding of our relationship with China and how we can work together to protect America's agriculture interests. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair would request other members submit their opening statements for the record. So our witnesses may begin their testimony to ensure that there is ample time for questions. Please recognize our colleague, the gentleman from South Dakota, Mr. Just Dusty Johnson, to introduce our first witness today. You know, Mr. Chairman, governing a nation should be a team sport. Unfortunately, there are a lot of free agents in politics. People who don't understand the value of shared vision and shared efforts. Luckily, our speaker this morning, uh, my friend, my governor, she knows how to work together. She understands that we get a lot more done when the federal government and the state governments are trying to find a path forward together. I would tell you, I don't think there's a month that goes by that she isn't showing the kind of leadership necessary to be able to work, have our team work with her team whether it's protecting American farmland from the Chinese Communist Party, getting uh, TikTok off government devices, uh, making sure that her state pension program has the flexibility to divest from CCP influences, making sure that the Farm Bill priorities are right, uh, managing the Black Hills National Forest in an appropriate way, protecting Mount Rushmore. I could go on for an hour, sir, and I know you don't want me to, of the ways that our speaker and... <laughs> and I have been able to work together. <laughs> and so I just got to tell you, I'm, I'm honored to be able to have a real South Dakotan, a real leader, and a real partner come on back to the Ag Committee and share some wisdom with us. Mr. Chairman, the governor of the great state of South Dakota, Christy Nome. Well, I thank the gentleman. Um, our, and welcome, Governor Nome. Our second witness is our esteemed colleague, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Mike Gallagher, who is the chairman of the Select Committee on the Chinese Co Communist Party. And uh, Congressman, thanks for joining us. Uh, hopefully our, our third witness today, and I know he has some scheduling conflicts initially here, so we're hoping he'll be able to join us in time to offer his perspective as another respected colleague of mine, uh, uh, of ours, uh, somebody I work with on uh, on many issues, including career and technical education. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Roger Krishnamurthy, uh, who is the ranking member of the Select Committee on the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, thank you to all our witnesses for joining us today. We will now proceed to your testimony. Uh, you each have five minutes. The timer is in front of you. We'll count down to zero, at which time your point your time has expired. Uh, Governor No, please begin when you're ready. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's an honor to be with all of you today, and thank you, Congressman, for that very kind introduction. You are a wonderful friend, and you're doing such a great job, maybe because you stole half my staff and kept them <laughs> when I left the Hill. No, but you're a, you're a wonderful representative for South Dakota. Thank you for caring so passionately for all of our people. You know, Chairman Thompson, I also have the honor of having one of my former chairmen on this committee sit in front of me today. Chairman Lucas was my chairman as I served here in the House of Representatives and had the chance to do two farm bills, but serving under his leadership on this committee was a special honor for me, and I loved uh, being a member of his team as we put together farm policy, which I always refer to as food policy for the United States of America. So it's wonderful to see you again, Chairman Lucas, and I look forward to continuing to receive your advice and wisdom over the years. Uh, Ranking Member Scott and members of the committee, thank you so much for letting me be here with you today to discuss this topic. As a former member of this committee, I know it very well that each day that you protect not only our nation's food supply, but you also are stewards of our land. And it is a treasure for us to be able to do that each 
and every day. I come before you today and sit as the 33rd governor of South Dakota. My home state is known for its gorgeous Black Hills, its rolling plains, but also iconic Mount Rushmore. We have a lot to be proud of, and if you haven't come to visit us, you probably should, because it is beautiful. Agriculture is our number one industry in our state, but tourism is our second largest industry. It's incredibly important to our people that our land stay in good shape and we continue to produce. This year is special to me because this is the 30th year that I have worked on agriculture policy. I have spent my lifetime working on policy, not just being a farmer and a rancher and raising my family on the land, but also being involved in meetings. Um, at the, just the age of 22, my dad was killed in an accident on our family farm. And I got angry when I found out how our family was going to be hit tragically by the death tax. I started showing up at meetings to talk about policy and how it impacted small farms. At that time, the U.S. Senate Majority Leader was Tom Daschle, who was a Democrat. And I ended up him appointing me to serve on the Farm Service Agency State Committee, which is the committee that oversees all the federal farm programs in the state of South Dakota. I did that for many years as a young uh, wife and mother, and also as a farmer and rancher running a large operation in our state. So I was heavily involved in the implementation of federal farm programs in our state, making sure they worked for all of our ranchers there, and that they were as flexible as possible to give them the freedom to choose how they ran their farms and to do it very well. I also served on many different commissions and task forces out here in Washington, D.C. during those years to help disadvantaged farmers, people that were in tough situations and different critical situations. And as the general manager of our business operations, I ran our farm for many decades. I was first elected to our state legislature in 2006 and became the assistant majority leader in the House. While there, I rewrote our agriculture property tax system. I ended up running for Congress, was elected, served on this committee, uh, and we worked on two farm bills while I served on this committee, also served on natural resources, on the Armed Services Committee, Education and Workforce Committee, and then ended on Ways and Means Committee when we did tax reform and was very proud to see that signed into law. In 2018, when I ran for governor in our state, and I won and then was reelected again last year or in 2022, and I'm in my second term now, I tell you all of this because I think it's important for you to know that my heart is with the land and it is with our people, but yet when it comes to policy that I know what I'm talking about. And I know it because I live it. Today I focus of this committee is the danger that China poses to American agriculture. Over the years I have witnessed this hostile communist country work to systematically take over our food supply chain. They have decades ago started buying our fertilizer companies, controlling our ability to access fertilizer, bring it into the United States. Then I watched them buy up our chemical companies as I worked on implementation of programs and policies at our state level and at the federal level. I watched us as we sold citizenship to Chinese communist members of the, of the Communist Party uh, for investment into our processing systems. And now most of our processing facilities are owned by the Communist Party or Chinese government. Uh, now they are coming for our land, and when they buy up our land, they will com complete their chain of control of our food supply. Between 2010 and 2020, the Chinese Communist Party's holdings of ag land increased by 5,300 percent. Reports now show that China owns about 3, 384,000 acres of U.S. ag land valued at over $2 billion. This should be alarming to all of us. USDA admits that not, this may not even account for all of the land that they own because of there's very little track of foreign interests that are involved in these large transactions. In fact, there's very little reporting that happens at the state or the federal level and little consequences for allowing countries who hate us from owning our land. Just this past summer, we had members of the Communist Party contact our state government and want to come and visit to our processing facilities, see our farms, and visit South Dakota. We declined all of those meetings, but just within days we received a phone call from the State Department telling us that those were Chinese spies. They were there to steal our intellectual property, to steal our genetics, and wanted to debrief us if we had met with them. Thank God we did not. We were, not, we were told they were there to help improve our trade relations, that they were there to improve our business and our exports, and instead they were there to steal from the United States of America. So the threat is very real to us every single day, what China is doing, and they have a thousand year plan to become the world dominating power in the world, and the only thing standing in their way is America. Just this past uh, 
summer, it was very clear to me when those Chinese spies were in our state that China wants to control us, and they want to do that by controlling our food supply. The Chinese Communist Party is not our friend. They're not our partner, and they're not our ally. They're our enemy. And they're a rapidly expanding national security threat that can't be ignored. So let me be clear. They are buying up our entire food supply chain, and when America can't feed itself and we rely on other members of another country to feed us, it becomes a national security issue. The country that feeds us will control us. And let me remind you why we do a farm bill every year. And I'm well aware that you have um, a priority to get that done, and I'm looking forward to getting a farm bill done, because that is the safety net for our farmers out there. In the past, the farm bill has always been a bipartisan issue, and it should continue to be a bipartisan issue. I had the opportunity to work on two of them, and it is simply a safety net for our farmers. It is important, and America decided years ago that we needed to have a farm bill to ensure that every family in this country had a safe and had an affordable food supply, that they had the ability to go to a grocery store and to put food on the table for their families, and that if a farmer had a good year, he could pay his bills, but if he had a bad year, he could lose everything. And we didn't want ever to have a drought or a flood or something happen that caused us to lose all of our small family farms and allow us to lose the ability to feed ourselves. Every family in this country recognizes the importance of a farm bill. I know you do too, and I'm looking forward to you getting one completed to make sure that we continue to feed ourselves in this country. The farm bill should be designed to help farmers and not environmental extremists. I hope that you'll continue to focus on making sure that we are working as a conservationist myself. I'm committed to protecting the abundance of our natural resources in my state, but so-called climate smart agriculture dictated by the Biden administration does not help farmers. And it does not help us put food on the table or conserve our natural resources. Well, you want wildlife habitat solutions that meets the needs of the people and the states that best serve this country and our ability to feed ourselves and protect ourselves. The Farm Bill manages risk and it is a safety net and I hope that you can get that done. Recent media reports show that the largest Chinese holder of American egg land is shipping food and medical supplies to China to be stockpiled by the Chinese military. We all saw when China purchased land in North Dakota that they claimed was for a corn processing plant that there wasn't going to be enough corn in that area to supply that plant and that it was just miles from a military installation. They were purchasing that land on purpose for national security reasons and that is why I've made it a priority in my state to ensure that that doesn't happen on my watch. In South Dakota, we worked for two years to make sure that we had a bill in place that would make sure we know who's buying our land and that it wasn't going to be from a country that hated us. China would never allow us to go to their country and buy land in their country. They don't even allow their own people to buy their land. There's no reason we should allow them to come into our country and buy our land, and especially not close to our military installations. South Dakota is the home to Ellsworth Air Force Base. It's the home of the B-1 bomber that has protected this country for the last 50 years. It's also home to the MQ-9 Reaper drones, which are in operation protecting us as well. But it will be the first home of the B-21s, which will be the, the bombing platform that will protect this country for the next 50 years. And it's incredibly important that we stop China and that we make sure other evil foreign governments don't come in and have the opportunity to buy up land next to these military installations. When we talk about food policy, Please talk about it from a national security standpoint. It is important that we grow our own food, that we produce it here, and that we're doing it in a way that protects yeah. the United States of America. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back. Yeah, very good. Well, thank you. Thank you, Governor. Uh, now, please recognize uh, Chairman Gallagher. Uh, begin when you're ready. Uh, thank you, Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Scott, members of the committee. Uh, what an incredible opportunity to be able to discuss the threat posed by the Chinese Communist Party in general, but to American agriculture uh, in particular. I want to thank the governor for her leadership in really sounding the alarm about this threat and also for uh, carrying the burden of dealing with Dusty Johnson before he leaves the room. Uh, he may not technically weigh that much, but that's a heavy burden. Uh, and I believe he is from your Dakota. I always get it confused. Um, uh, a year ago, uh, a gentleman named Xiang Hitao, a PRC national, pled guilty to conspiracy to commit economic espionage and was sentenced to more than two years in prison for stealing intellectual property from his employer, which was a, Mon a Monsanto subsidiary. Xiang took copies of the algorithm on a one-way flight back to China, where he later worked for the Chinese Academy of Sciences Institute of Soil Science. So here you have an example of someone stealing American technology and bringing it directly back to the Chinese Communist Party. 
which reflects the CCP's approach to agriculture, agriculture and food security in that it's not just about economic competition. To quote General Secretary Xi Jinping himself, it is a national security issue of extreme importance. The PRC is the largest importer of coin, corn, soybeans, wheat, rice, and dairy products in the world. The CCP views food security as an existential issue. She understands that if China were to invade Taiwan, it would be subject to blockade and economic sanctions, and therefore the PRC would face massive challenges in feeding its population. So to put it bluntly, the Chinese Communist Party is actively engaged in economic warfare against the United States, and our agriculture sector is already a prime target. The governor mentioned the share of U.S. farmland owned by Chinese-linked firms increasing more than five-fold between 2010 and 2021. These are only the acquisitions that we know about. There could be much more because, as you all know, the federal oversight system for reporting foreign ownership is alarmingly lax, and enforcement is very minimal. For example, uh, the governor referenced the issue with the Fufang Group, which attempted to purchase land uh, close to Grand Forks Air Force Base in the other Dakota in 2021. Uh, they did not report the purchase to USDA until the U.S. media started asking questions about it. That's unacceptable. If you look more broadly at the entire CFIUS process, at least three problems emerge. One, the U.S. government has no way of tracking land purchases by foreign adversaries. There was a recent GAO report that found USDA is incapable of properly tracking such land purchases by problematic actors. Second, even upon discovering a problematic transaction, CFIUS often finds it has no jurisdiction, despite the fact that in the FIRMA bill, we tried to give CFIUS said jurisdiction. So just as happened with the Fufang acquisition, because the Air Force Base in question was not listed as a sensitive site by CFIUS, CFIUS claimed they had no authority to even review the transaction. That's unacceptable. And third and finally, CFIUS can't review greenfield investments in our farmland or consider our domestic food security as a risk factor. So our foreign adversaries are able to purchase thousands of acres of our farmland, and CFIUS can't even consider the potential impact on our food supply. This strikes me as something that Democrats and Republicans could come together right now in this Congress and solve by passing something like the Protecting U.S. Farmland and Sensitive Sites from Foreign Adversaries Act. I know there are members of this committee on both sides of the aisle. Ms. Slotkin and I have worked very productively on this issue. This is something we can get done even in divided government. Give CFIUS the authorities and resources it needs to make sure that our foremost adversary can't buy land near critical infrastructure and military bases. It should be a no-brainer. I would also suggest we can do better in protecting our agricultural IP by passing bills like the Biosecure Act, which uh, my ranking member, Raja Krishnamurthy, is a co-sponsor of. This would ensure that U.S. taxpayer dollars don't go to CCP-backed firms like Beijing Genomics Institute that want to collect the genetic sequences of plants and animals from American farmers. And on the flip side, we should protect our food security for generations to come by cataloging the genetic sequences of U.S. plants and animals that we need uh, to help American families, uh, keep American families fed. So in closing, I would just say, I spent a lot of my time as chairman of the Select Committee on China asking why any of this matters. Why are you having this hearing? Why do we care about the threat posed by the Chinese Communist Party? And it's not just that they're stealing our, our intellectual property or trying to dominate uh, our food supply. I really do think, and I don't think this is alarmism, I think this is a recognition of reality. If you read what Xi Jinping is saying to the party and to his people, I believe that the CCP is preparing for a war with the United States. There's no doubt they would prefer the fruits of war without the actual costs. That is to be sure. But they are preparing nonetheless. And he has told us repeatedly that he is prepared to use force, if necessary, to achieve his lifelong ambition, which is, of course, taking Taiwan, thereby dominating the region, and ultimately displacing the United States as the most powerful country in the world. So if we want to avoid that outcome, which would be a terrible outcome, a war with China would be horrific if you've ever participated in a war game. And I know there's many on this committee that serve that understand the costs of war. We have to abide by the old adage, if we want peace, we must prepare for war. And that is the challenge, to mobilize our colleagues and our constituents to do difficult, costly, but important things that put us on a path to deterring war. Thank you for having this important hearing, and thank you for letting me go a little bit longer. Hey, Chairman, thank you so much. Thanks for your leadership and your testimony, and I know you have a hearing to get to, so uh, 
uh, uh, feel free to debate. I could, I could imagine what Raj would say if he were here, if you'd like me to. <laughs> Happy, we've spent right. so much time together, I feel like I can There you go. The well, C-SPAN is covering this hearing. You'll be able to hear him uh, um, time delayed. All right, thank uh, you so much. Future. No, thank you. Uh, we're, we are going to take uh, an opportunity why uh, uh, Mr. Kristen Morthy is uh, at another hearing right now on his way. And so we're going to take uh, two questions from each side of the uh, of, of the, the dais here uh, for, the, for the governor, who's uh, been more than generous with her time. And, and uh, so first, I'm going to recognize uh, Mr. Lucas uh, from Oklahoma for five minutes questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Governor. It's good to see you back in this room again. I think we'd both agree that a strong, healthy, vibrant, rural America and production agriculture is the key to our national security. But I serve in a body now where memories are short. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to go back 10 years ago to when you and I worked together, mm -hmm. that two and a half year struggle, as you remember, to create the third generation farm bill. And maybe memories have numbed with time, but not just the way you conducted yourself in this committee on behalf of your constituents, but in those Republican conference meeting, committee meetings where we together battle diligently to get the attention of elected leadership about the importance of these farm bills. I will forever be eternally grateful for you backing me up in the way you handled the speaker and the floor leader on behalf of rural America and production agriculture. Huh. So thank you well, for that tenacity, which I suspect is only grown stronger with time in your role as governor. Plus, sir, you keep lighting people on fire and they get a little tougher and understand that, that what you all say and matters and what you do matters, the words you use have consequences and who matter, it matters who's in leadership. So I have gone at times in my different roles, recognize that, that leadership needs to sit and listen to people and have conversations. We've become a country that has become addicted to being offended by each other. And therefore, we love to be offended by something that somebody has said, and I would just ask that we start listening to each other. The farm bill should be bipartisan. It should be bipartisan that we be able to put a safety net out there, and I'm asking you to do it for the consideration of our food policy. It is, if we think a pandemic was scary, can you imagine what happens if we can't feed our people? We are only three meals away from a crisis. And I've recognized and noticed as governor, as the CEO of my state, how much control China has, not just over manipulating our currency, stealing our IP, things we've known forever, that even I, my pension funds, I can't even get Vanguard to say that China's not an emerging market anymore. They're, everybody in the world will agree that they're not an emerging market. They should give me an ability to invest in a fund that doesn't have China in it, but I don't want to do that as a governor for my people to get them the best returns possible. But now when I look at our food supply system and our processing system and we recognize that China's not our ally, yes, we do trade with them. And when we do trade, and I worked on trade agreements when I served on the Ways and Means Committee, um, I had the ability to notice that when we did trade agreements, we created friendlier neighborhoods. But we can't do that if we're not talking to each other and having conversations. So that farm bill, even though I picked a lot of fights with my own fellow Republicans, we got them done. And we're going to have to challenge both members of both parties to come back to the table to make sure we have that safety net so we continue to feed our, farm, our families. And thank goodness for that tenacity you demonstrated then and continue to demonstrate. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Gentleman yields back. Now please recognize the ranking member for five minutes questions. Thank you very much, Governor. How are you? I'm doing good. Good to see and you again. And it's good to have you with us. But tell me this. What is your opinion of Trump's proposal for a 60% tariff on all Chinese imports? And are your farmers ready to face the potential consequences of this? I think that that is a proposal that people are still looking at and having conversations about. And that's a great conversation for you to continue to have as well with the Republican members here as well to weigh in to make sure we get the best policy in place. Because policy is what matters. And the debate and the discussion is incredibly important. You, you made a comment in your opening statement, Ranking Member Scott, that you talked about the fact that we were here to talk about ag policy, not about people policy. And, and for me, you know, I would say that all ag policy is people policy. That what you do on this committee is 
is people policy. It's about feeding people. It's about the programs that take care of needy folks that, that need to have that kind of help. It's also about making sure we have many farmers out on our land and that we have that safety net there. So you have an incredible opportunity to do something here in this committee that's not happening anywhere else on Capitol Hill. And I hope you catch that vision. Nobody really cared, I would say, years ago that much about a little state called South Dakota. We get one member of the House. I don't, when I came here as a Congresswoman, I didn't get a delegation. I was all by myself. So I became friends with everybody, Republicans or Democrats, because if I wanted to get stuff done, I could. We were the first state to ban TikTok and, and led, and after that, dozens of states banned TikTok because of the threat that it is. We also okay, Governor, I got one more question yes, for you in my short time. If you listen to my opening statement, mm -hmm. I hope you understand how concerned I am about foreign governments coming in and buying up our land, mm -hmm. especially our farmland. Food makes the Agriculture Committee the most powerful committee up here in Congress because you can do without a lot of things, but the one thing we cannot do without is food. Right. And I'm concerned about the China impact, mm -hmm. especially, in buying up this farmland. And when you correlate that with the number of immigrants coming into this country from China, mm -hmm. that's a long way to walk. And they ain't walking to get to Mexico or South America to get in those trips mm -hmm. where they're coming across our border. I got to wonder about that. And I want to ask you, how much land in South Dakota have gone to foreign interests? And I, I want you to know mm -hmm. that I agree with you. Mm -hmm. This is a national security of, of high monumental interests. And we've got to get to the bottom of it. How is your state reacting to the buying up of land by foreign governments, particularly China, in your state? Well, sir, that was the question that I had when I became governor. And what I found is we had a law in the books that prevented foreign evil governments from buying our land, but there was no reporting mechanism and there was no consequences. So therefore, we didn't know who owned our land, who owned our investment. We couldn't determine that because nobody was reporting it. And then if we did find that there was somebody purchasing land that was a country such as North Korea, Iran, Russia, China, Venezuela, Cuba, that there was no reporting, therefore we didn't know, and there would be no consequences if we did find out. So last year to my legislature, I brought a bill that would have allowed me to create a CFIUS board at the state level. That's really what I wanted to have in place was that the states had the opportunity to have a CFIUS board that reviewed those transactions and then put forward consequences to make sure that it was done closer to the people and that we had more accountability and were truly looking at real estate transactions and putting that in place. That bill did not pass, and what we ended up passing this year was a bill that added reporting mechanisms to the law we already had with consequences but forcing the sale of that land. So now I will know when we have a bill in the books that has those two components we need to know to really truly get the answer. That but there want. are foreign interests that are buying land in South Dakota? I believe that there are countries that own land that are friendly to the United States. I do not know if there are unfriendly ones that are buying ag land right now. I do know that, that some of our biggest processing facilities are owned by China. I mean, Smithfield Foods processes in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, my largest city, and they are Chinese owned. And well, they have been difficult for me to work with. So. Well, I want to thank you, Chairman, for having this hearing because I truly believe mm -hmm. that food is now a national security issue. Thank you. Thank you, Ranking Member. I thank the gentleman. Uh, we're going to have two additional questions for the governor, and then we're going to get uh, a testimony from my good friend uh, from Illinois, uh, my son and daughter-in-law's congressman, um, oh, good. Mr. Kristen Morthy. So I'm going to yield to 
Congressman Austin Scott, and that will be followed by Congresswoman Slotkin. Uh, Mr. Scott, you have five minutes for questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm going to get a, a little technical in this, but the reason that it is so important for us to be aggressive with China on the ag issue is that this is a basic necessity. We're not talking about toys. We're talking about the chemicals that it takes for our food supply. We're talking about the, chemi the, the technology in our seed supply. And U.S. companies less than 10 years ago were 80% of the global seed supply. And today we're about 30% of the global seed supply. And so when you allow um, countries like China through uh, companies like Syngenta to become one of the largest seed suppliers in the world and the largest chemical supplier in the world, I might add, then you are putting one of your basic daily needs at risk, which is, which is your food supply. And so, uh, Governor, I want to commend you for being aggressive with that. I think it, that it is way past time we be aggressive with China. They are not a... They are not an economic competitor anymore. They are an adversary, mm -hmm. and and you know we, we have to acknowledge that. And if tariffs what it takes, if tariffs are what it takes to bring uh, manufacturing back not just to the United States and to the Western Hemisphere, then that's just part of what it's going to take for us to have self control over our our basic necessities. Um, you were here during the last farm bill. Uh, one of the big discussions. That, that we have asked for help for and not been able to get it from uh, many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle is uh, an increase in reference prices. Mm -hmm. uh, as you've talked with your farmers and your producers out there, can you tell me uh, what you're hearing from them about the increase in input cost and the need for an increase in reference prices so that they have a safety net as we push forward? If you don't address the increase in reference prices and don't, don't bring them up to where they should be, there is no safety net. So just as far as doing these programs and making sure that you're making adjustments to all the programs and the components that are a part of a farm bill, that's one of the very most important things you can do to manage risk. And I want you to remember what farmers do every year. And for those of you that aren't farmers, <clears throat> they literally go to a bank and they borrow money to buy land. Then they borrow more money to go buy a tractor and a corn planter. And then they go back and they get an operating note so that they can buy their seed, their fertilizer, their chemical, and then they put it in the dirt. And they hope that maybe it'll rain and something will grow and that months later they'll be able to go back and pick something up and harvest enough so that they can pay their bills. They're some of the biggest gamblers that I know in the world because they bury, bury millions of dollars in the dirt and they're taking a chance because they really truly do believe that producing food is a world need and it's a need that America needs to have. So at least give them a safety net. Because it's not just the fact that they operate on faith and that they operate hev heavily leveraged. That's why they can have one year that's a drought and lose their entire operation was because of the risk that they take. But increasing those reference prices is critical to them to give them a safety net that even works and functions to get them through a situation like that. And that's why I've always talked about the Farm Bill as our national food policy. It's because we decided as a country it was important that we always feed ourselves, that we don't depend on another country to feed us. And therefore, it does us good to have a much more competitive and affordable food supply if there's a lot of farmers out here and that it's a safe and an affordable one because we have a farm bill and we have a safety net program to ensure that they stay on the land. Well, let me say thank you for your testimony. I appreciate you and uh, the type of member that you were when you were here and, uh, and the governor you've been. Uh, I would finish with this, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think the last call I got was not actually from a farmer. It was from a banker. Yeah. And his response was, I don't think that there's a commodity uh, that we grow in the state of Georgia where our farmers can make a profit this year at the current prices with the input costs where they are. So I will yield back and I appreciate you. Gentleman yields back. Now recognize Congresswoman Slotkin for five Thank minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Governor, for being here. Um, I want to, you know, reiterate and support, I think, what you've seen on a bipartisan basis, which is food security is national security. I'm a former CIA officer. There are two of us on this committee, um, and, and um, um, that's my in entire sort of lens with which I look through this, we should always be able to feed ourselves by ourselves. Um, and you're right, during COVID, you know, my family's uh, in the hot dog business. Mm -hmm. And um, during COVID, um, 
we were concerned with the meat processing plants right. going down with COVID that, um, you know, Americans don't know what it's like to walk into a store and see no protein on the shelves and the panic that that would create and the, and the concern that that would create. Um, I also live on my, my family farm. Um, I, I guess um, I, just to pick up on a thread that um, Representative Gallagher mentioned, this idea of having farmland purchases mm -hmm. go through what's called the CFIUS process. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and I think, the, uh, again, I see it as a federal issue because based on your example, right, where the, the intelligence community, the full weight of our, of our sort of um, uh, insider information that we may have on a company, on individuals, on their intentions, does reside within the federal government. I respect your your um, attempt to do one at the state level, but just like you were about to meet with a bunch of businessmen and the State Department came in and said, we've got real issues with them, that resides at the federal government level. So there's a bunch of bipartisan bills um, on um, putting all purchases of farmland, not just farmland adjacent to a military base, adjacent to a sensitive site, but all farmland um, to go through that CFIUS process and let um, our intelligence community tell us whether this is a risk or not. Last week, myself and um, Congressman Blake Moore from Utah, Republican, went a step further. And I'd ask you to think about this. And we said, it's not just farmland. If you have a company coming in building a big manufacturing site, I'm from Michigan, right? If you have a, a, a company coming in to do a huge purchase of our infrastructure, mm -hmm. like hog uh, right. slaughter, right? Um, you should be putting that through that same intelligence community process um, to help us understand if that's a strategic threat to us. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're, we all are trying to solve the same problem, which is how do we make sure that nations that could be real adversaries potentially mm -hmm. down the road are, are not able to purchase major infrastructure and assets in the United States. But we have to make distinction. We can't hit it with a, a giant you know, club. Um, biggest purchasers of farmland in Michigan are Canada and Holland. Mm -hmm. I'm not real stressed yeah. about the Canadians who are my neighbors. You know, I used to go there to drink when yeah. the drinking age was 19. I'm not real stressed about the Canadians buying land in the state of Michigan. It has to be limited, tailored. Um, but I do think it's an area of bipartisan cooperation. Um, we have to do that mm -hmm. without demonizing people from China mm -hmm. who are living under this government mm -hmm. that I bet they really, really don't like. Mm -hmm. We want the best and brightest from China to want to be students here and stay here and build their lives here as opposed to take information back to China. So that's my, my one ask is let's have a real policy conversation. Let's do it on a bipartisan basis. We have the will here, but let's also in the process not demonize all human beings with a giant brush mm -hmm. um, um, in a way, again, as you mentioned, where leaders set the tone. So that's that, but I agree with you on many, many things on this. Would ask you to think about taking it one step further from just farmland to the mm -hmm. big infrastructure that we know that they're interested in purchasing here with connections to the Chinese Communist Party. Well, and that, that would be something that obviously we've had a lot of conversations about in South Dakota because I am alarmed at that. Because the first next question is, well, what about commercial property? What about, yep. I mean, it's not that they haven't been conducting nefarious activities from smaller tracts of land and where does this stop? We should all be analyzing it. That's why I proposed a CFIUS model at the state level is because I, I get the, privilege and I get the opportunity to be solely focused on South Dakota. Mm -hmm. So I know what's going on there better than I think someone does that doesn't live in South Dakota and lives all the way across the country. And, and it's no offense to the federal government, but it is very rare that you guys fix anything. Um, and a lot of times when we're doing something, I'm doing it in South Dakota or another governor's doing it and you're taking that as a model then and using it. And frankly, the Constitution of the United States gives us states rights. Uh, and a lot more opportunities to lead than what it grants to the federal government. So by giving us the opportunity for me to fight for my people and to bring policies forward, it gives other states the chance to do that and the federal government follows in place. I would use TikTok as an example. By us leading, by banning TikTok on government devices, dozens of states followed our lead. Then the federal government came in and recognized the threat that TikTok was and how it was collecting data and spying on us and being used to study the American people and figure out how to continue to, to steal our information. So you know, I would think let, let the states be incubators of using what our Constitution intended us to be on possible models like this, that then the federal government as well can proliferate and move forward and do things right. I'm much more nimble than the federal government is. 
thank the gentlelady, um, and I thank the governor. Uh, yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you so much for Honor and a privilege. taking the time, the expense to come and to spend some time with us, and and your leadership on this issue is much, much, uh, much appreciated. So at this point, uh, you're excused, and and I'm going to recognize. Uh, my good friend from Illinois, uh, who is the uh, vice chair uh, or the uh, ranking member of the select committee on uh, on China, uh, Mr. Raja Krishnamurthy, for his test five minute testimony. Uh, Congressman, go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, ranking member Scott. Uh, thank you to the committee for inviting me to speak today. Ag has always been a cornerstone of the U.S.-China relationship, and Chairman Gallagher and I worked closely with our members on the Ag Committee on this important issue. In August 2023, the chairman and I traveled to Dysart, a small town in Iowa. In 2011, not very far from Dysart, a farmer saw a man digging in the cornfields. After some investigation, authorities discovered that this man was not just digging for fun. He was looking for proprietary corn seeds to send back to his employer, a Chinese seed corn company. The man eventually tried to ship 250 pounds of corn seeds to Hong Kong disguised in Costco-sized packs of microwavable popcorn, just like this. That's clever. The total cost of this one case of IP theft was estimated to be $30 million because the folks in China wanted to reverse engineer the contents of this to be able to produce the same back in China. Ag technology is a prime target of IP theft because American technology and farming are the best and most productive in the world. The Select Committee's bipartisan economic report released in December last year included broad recommendations on how to pr best protect IP. For the ag sector, we need to continue to improve coordination between local and federal law enforcement agencies and properly resource and train the DOJ to prosecute these particular crimes. There are other ag-related concerns addressed in our economic report. Congresswoman Slotkin and, and Congresswoman Hinson have already transformed another economic report recommendation into the Securing American Ag Act which will require the USDA to study the supply chains of our ag inputs, including vitamins, animal feed, and pesticides, where China has been increasingly dominating the market and crowding out American and other suppliers. As we continue to remain in an era of uncertainty in our trade relationship with China, we also need to better protect American farmers from retaliation by the CCP, including by diversifying ag export markets for American farmers. Now, I know this committee has been looking at the issue of land sales. There are legitimate concerns with certain land purchases by CCP affiliates, CCP affiliated entities, especially close to sensitive and military sites. However, as we address these problems, we have to make sure that the cure is not worse than the disease. Some purported solutions have had very real and harmful effects on the Asian American community as well. Dozens of bills across the country, for instance, target Chinese nationals regardless of whether they are affiliated with the CCP and regardless of the proximity of their land acquisitions to sensitive sites. Florida, for example, passed SB 264, a law that prohibits Chinese nationals from purchasing real property in the state. This law had a serious negative impact on the Asian American community. I'll just give you one example. There's the case of Ziming Zhu, a political asylee living in Florida who was persecuted by the CCP and who fled to the United States. He was beginning to rebuild his life in Florida. Since the, since the passage of SB 264, Mr. Zhu was forced to cancel the contract for the purchase of what was otherwise going to be his new home in his new country. The lesson here is very clear. When land purchase bills target individuals who are merely chi Chinese immigrants, they often target those outside of the intended audience. The Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund filed a lawsuit against this particular Florida law on equal protection grounds. Laws like two, SB 264 are neither fair nor justified. 
And in the early 20th century, states passed similar alien land laws in more than a dozen other states prohibiting J Chinese and Japanese immigrants from becoming landowners. Those policies severely restricted economic opportunities and exacerbated discrimination, and every single one of those laws were repealed one by one by one in all of those states. So please, as you consider these land purchase laws, let's be careful. You folks don't want to pursue policies that discriminate against anybody. So in that spirit, let's be careful not to adopt or to encourage those types of policies. Chairman Thompson and Ranking Member Scott, thank you again for this very special opportunity to testify be before this very distinguished committee. The Select Committee very much looks forward to working with your committee in the future, and I thank you again. Well, Congressman Kristen Morthy, thank you so much for your testimony. I know that uh, this is a busy day for all of us, including you. With You've been bouncing from hearings, and uh, so we're going to excuse you from the, from the panel as well. Uh, and, uh, but thank you for joining us. Thank you for your leadership and, and for sharing with us this morning. Much thank appreciated. You. Thank you so much. We're going to take just a brief break to uh, uh, brief, uh, no more than five minutes uh, recess to allow our first panel witnesses to depart, our, our second panel witnesses to take their seats, and then we will uh, reconvene. So we'll reconvene basically as soon as uh, our witnesses get uh, comfortably seated here and, and ready to go. The committee will come to order. I'm really pleased to welcome our. Uh, our second panel on this topic today uh, regarding the threats of China to American agriculture. Our first witness for the second panel of our hearing today is Mr. Josh uh, Gackel, who is the president of the American Soybean Association. Our second witness for this panel is Mr. Nova Daly, who brings extensive public and private sector experience, uh, 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 numerous agencies, uh, the Senate, and the CFIUS Committee, on, uh, all involved on national security matters. Our third and final witness for this panel is a, a great uh, friend of, of the committee and of the industry, Ambassador Kip Tom, the former United States Ambassador to United Nations Agencies for Food and Agriculture. Uh, thank you, our witnesses, for joining us today. We'll now proceed to your testimony. You each have five minutes. The timer in front of you will count down to zero, at which time, uh, at which point your time has expired, um, and then that will be followed by a, a question and answer period after all three of you have spoken. So, Mr. Gackle, please begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, Chairman Thompson and Ranking Member Scott and members of the House Agriculture Committee, and thank you for allowing me to testify today. My name is Josh Gackle, and I'm a soybean farmer from North Dakota where I farm with my dad and brother on a third generation family farm. This year, I also have the privilege of serving as president of the American Soybean Association, which represents U.S. soybean farmers across 30 states. Soybeans are the largest U.S. agricultural export, and robust international trade is a priority for our farmers. U.S. soy is actively working in 112 markets across the world to introduce new customers to our high quality, high protein crop. Opening new markets is just one step followed by time, attention, and long-term relationship maintenance to ensure market access. Our trading partners are all critical to the success of U.S. soy farmers, but no export destination compares to China. In the last marketing year, the export value of U.S. soybeans totaled over $32 billion. China accounted for nearly $19 billion of this total. For perspective, the next largest destination by value totaled approximately $3 billion. The sheer scale of China's demand for soybeans cannot be replaced. In farmer terms, one in every three rows grown in the U.S. is shipped to China to fill demand. During the 2018 trade war, U.S. soybean exports to China came to a halt. In an estimate of the impact of retaliatory tariff tariffs on U.S. agriculture, the USDA found that the value of U.S. exports to China increased, decreased 76 percent from 2017 to 2018. It also estimated the trade war cost U.S. agriculture over $27 billion. Soybeans accounted for 71% of these annualized losses. This has had major consequences on the competitive landscape for U.S. soybean growers. 
As a result of the trade war, Brazil ramped up production to meet Chinese demand. Beyond capturing additional market share in China, Brazil was prompted to increase its land area in agriculture production. In the 2017 and 2018 marketing year, Brazil overtook the United States as the world's largest producer of soybeans. Our farmers now face incre increasing competition with Brazil in every export market, not just China. The trade war also damaged our reputation as a reliable provider of soybeans and soy products in global markets. The Section 301 tariffs and the retaliatory, retaliatory trade actions have jeopardized our place in these markets and damaged in-country relationships developed over decades. At times, our customers looked elsewhere for their needs to avoid trade risk or excess duties. As the United States considers actions to protect our national security interests, we must also maintain and protect our economic and trade interests as well. Soybean growers need predictability and certainty that we will, that we will retain market access in China. My written testimony provides three policy recommendations. Number one, reject legislative attempts to repeal or modify China's permanent normal trade relation status. ASA is very concerned that revoking PNTR for China would have severe consequences. In 2018, U.S. soybean exports to China were among the first agri agricultural commodities targeted for retaliatory tariffs. And if passed this prologue, it is entirely possible that U.S. soybeans would imp be impacted yet again. Number two, pass a comprehensive farm bill this year that meets the needs of U.S. agriculture. The new Farm Bill should include additional investment into trade promotion programs that are critical to the long-term long -term success of U.S. soy abroad. Funding levels for the Market Access Program and the Foreign Market Development Program have been largely unchanged for decades, even though demand for these programs has increased. The new Farm Bill should also include improvements to the farm safety net. During the trade war, U.S. soybean farmers experienced firsthand the ins insufficient farm safety net under the current Farm Bill. Uh, very simply, we need better tools to help farmers in times of economic disruption and greater resources to expand and diversify trade markets. And finally, number three, exercise congressional oversight authority to press the administration to re-engage in negotiations for bilateral and multilateral free trade agreements. The U.S. was once a leader in establishing new free trade, free trade agreements, but our last new FTA entered into force in 2012 despite the U.S. having negotiated the Trans-Pacific Partnership. That's over 10 years of inactivity for codified market expansion that could have helped U.S. agriculture. While at the same time, our international competitors have worked to gain increased market access. So thank you again as a farmer from North Dakota and on behalf of the American Soybean, Soybean Association, it's a privilege to be with you and thank you for this opportunity to share the perspective of U.S. soybean farmers with you. Uh, I look forward to your questions, Mr. Chair. Mr. Kackle, thank you so much for your leadership and your, your testimony today. Uh, now, please recognize Mr. Daly. Please begin when you're ready. Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Scott, and distinguished members of this committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today uh, to discuss this critical and timely matter. I'm honored and humbled to be before you today among the exceptional panelists that you've assembled. The views I share are my own and informed by my service in the U.S. government, where I was fortunate enough to serve along colleagues in the National Security Council, Commerce Department, Senate, and Treasury, where I ran the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. Um, I got to witness firsthand uh, for many years uh, the actions of China as it conducted and directed actions through its businesses, nefariously through third parties. Given that experience and years of private sector helping U.S. companies address competition and malicious activity by Chinese entities, the focus of my testimony is the national and economic security considerations involved in Chinese acquisitions of U.S. agriculture and agricultural-related business and supply chains. That said, as a baseline, and as my witness testimony relays, recent laws implemented by China effectively compel any Chinese entity to act at the direction of the Chinese state, i.e. the Communist Party of China. So the question before the committee is really, what do you as leaders of this country believe that the United States should accept regarding ownership and control by the Communist Party of China over U.S. assets of agricultural land, production, and supply chains? Problematically, as you know, there are serious gaps in current federal laws, and reporting 
that expose our military and critical infrastructure to vulnerabilities and increasingly impact U.S. farmers, ranchers, and producers as they face challenges from state-driven Chinese actors. Thwarted and planned Chinese investments like the Fufang wet corn mill plant in North Dakota and land and farm acquisitions in Oregon, Texas, Nevada, in close proximity to point of the spear U.S. military bases and nuclear facilities is not coincidental. Given China's regional and global military intense vectors that provide intelligence are constantly being sought, whether they provide locations for cranes, silos, windmills, or farms above or adjacent to military or sensitive facilities or telecommunication towers or underground cables. Brazen IP violations of U.S. seed, GMOs, and other agricultural technologies have placed at risk the nation's continued agricultural technology leadership. There are ample cases of Chinese agents being and having been caught uh, attempting to take such technologies. China's perpetual dependence on agricultural imports ensures that their goals for independence from foreign dependencies will remain a priority. Further, China's massive cyber warfare divisions, notably PLA Unit 61398, have the capability to disrupt key American infrastructure critical to our agriculture, this includes power and water utilities, as well as communication and transportation systems. China's global acquisitions and supply chain monopolies, including Internet of Things technologies, continue to expand unchecked and unaddressed. We have significant dependencies on parts, electronics, and other import inputs to our agricultural machinery. The nutritional needs of our livestock is also under significant dependence, as well as inputs to pesticides and herbicides. China is also acquiring companies as export platforms for Chinese market, globally and in the United States. Such diversion of product can have sizable negative impacts on U.S. producers. Further, China's acquisition of global agricultural storage and logistic assets and trading markets should be examined. Lastly, given the advances in farm technologies, our reliance on supply chains that provide nefarious Chinese actors kill switches to our machinery. Our eyes are our production. These all are matters that should be addressed. But there are solutions. Federal laws addressing foreign ownership should be considered, changes to them, given the legal vulnerabilities of state-to-state -state restrictions. There are adjustments that can be made to the jurisdiction of CFIUS to better respond to Chinese farm and other ag agricultural acquisitions. As led by this committee, the GAO has provided solutions for better foreign farm ownership reporting standards, and a number of members have pointed to additional solutions in reporting. Stronger cybersecurity vigilance championed by members here is also critical, and there are a host of other possible solutions in the face of funding challenges that can ensure our nation remains vigilant on applying solutions to the uninvited, unwarranted, and increasingly sophisticated threats that certain actors present to our nation and food security. That concludes my opening remarks, and I look forward to hearing from you and addressing, to the best of my ability, any questions on matters you wish to raise. Mm -hmm. Sir, thank you very much. Appreciate your experience, uh, significant experience, and, and uh, your input. Uh, now I'm pleased to uh, recognize Ambassador Tom. Please uh, proceed with five minutes of testimony whenever you're ready. Honorable Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Scott, and distinguished members of the House Committee on Agriculture. As a lifelong farmer and a former ambassador to the Rome-based UN Food and Agriculture Organizations, I would like to share my perspective with you today on the threat of China to America's food supply and agricultural systems. I add, the world is watching us today. Americans need to understand that our national security is dependent upon our food security Americans cannot any longer take agriculture and our food systems for granted. Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party recognize the importance of food in relation to their position of power in the world. The CCP's goal is to reshape the world order through their control of the BRIC nations, global trade, and the Belts and Road Initiative, all to attain economic superiority over the United States and our allies. To meet these goals, they are strategically growing their agriculture production domestically and globally at the expense of the United States. I will address a number of these risks by the CCP that we could deal with immediately. 
First, cybersecurity. Threats to the United States agriculture are diverse and can have significant impacts on the industry. Some of the key concerns include intellectual property theft. The Chinese have targeted proprietary farming data, such as crop yield data, seeding or fertilizer algorithms, breeding information, and biotechnology research, which will lead to a loss of competitive advantage for the United States. I have seen this firsthand in the seed production industry. Several Chinese nationals were sending proprietary seeds in our area from production fields and shipping them back to China. These Chinese nationals were caught and convicted, but how many were not caught? According to the American Seed Trade Association, it takes five to 15 years to develop a seed variety at a cost of over $100 million. It also estimates that the annual value of agriculture seed production in the U.S. is over $11 billion annually. Data-driven attacks, precision agriculture, rely heavily on this data, as examples like farms like ours produce over a terabyte of data annually that is exclusive to our farm and is a major driver to our sustainability and productivity. We are at extreme risk of the theft or attack of this data, which could alter or disrupt our systems and lead to incorrect farming decisions and likely harm yields. There have been numerous attempts also by the Chinese to steal this data, but fortunately they have been caught and convicted. Again, how many were not caught? Infrastructure attacks. Critical infrastructure from the electrical grid to supply chain logistics and broadband could be targeted in disrupting our food supply. When we consider ransomware, farming operations could be halted by ransomware attacks, demanding payments to restore access to essential digital systems, and we all can remember the ransom attacks on JBS several years ago, which disrupted the entire supply chain from livestock production operations to the consumer's dinner table. The $11 million ransom was paid, but the cost of JBS and the agricultural supply chain was many multiples greater. Espionage. The Chinese are creative in their attempts to steal as much information as possible from as many sources as possible from the USDA or FSA offices to our industries, to cranes in our ports, and from any conduit that flows data or conversations. Although the U.S. government has, is aware of these threats, we need to strengthen protection for America's food supply and economic advantage. This includes identifying vulnerabilities and improving the protective measures of government and private entities against cyber threats. Next, portions of our supply chain have been offshore, including several critical building blocks for our food systems, such as crop protection products and crop nutrients. These are the basic elements that nourish crops, protect them from weeds, insects, and diseases. A recent USDA supply chain report indicates that 70%, 70% of the crop protection products that are produced globally, most from China. Another 40% of the world's phosphorus supply originates in China. Imagine if they shut off our supply. Without crop protection products or crop nutrients, yields will decrease, requiring substantially more land to maintain current production levels. The economic impact of farmers, consumers, and our nation would have devastating consequences. This would lead to higher consumer prices and food insecurity in the United States and around the world. This is a national security threat to the United States and our allies. Therefore, the absence of crop protection and crop nutrient products would have a complex and far-reaching impact. The answer is we need to allow for reasonable and durable regulations to prevail to allow the United States to bring this manufacturing capacity back home while supporting those that are already manufacturing these critical products here at home in the U.S. to feed the Americans and the world. In summary, whether the impact is from cybersecurity threats or from minimized access to crop nutrients or crop protection products, the Chinese are strategically attempting to build their dominance in a world over food systems. These moves are coming at the expense of American innovation, but are amplified by our burdensome regulatory environment. The people in these chambers on this hill need to take action to bring our supply chains home, protect our innovation, and increase our funding for research and development. Now is the time for a national strategy for our agricultural and food systems. If not, America could once again face food insecurity like we did 100 years ago. It is time to stop taking agriculture and our food systems for granted. Again, the world is watching.
I yield the floor back to you, Chairman Thompson. Ambassador, thank you so much for your record of service leadership and, quite frankly, your input today in this very important topic. We're now going to, uh, at this time, members will be recognized for questions in order of seniority, alternating between majority and minority members, and in order of arrival for those who joined us after the hearing convened. I'm going to defer my line of questions to the very end. Um, each of us will be recognized for five minutes each in order to allow us to get as many questions as possible. Starting on the majority side, I now recognize uh, Mr. Lucas from Oklahoma for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Thompson, for calling this hearing and to the witnesses for testifying today. During my time in Congress, I've been engaged in and party to many discussions around the topic of foreign investment in the United States due to my position on the House Financial Services Committee. This is due to the committee's jurisdiction over the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, or CFIUS, that is located within Treasury. One of the most challenging aspects of this topic is the tension between two widely shared goals of protecting our national security while fostering a welcoming economic environment. Congress has attempted to strike that balance during various reforms of the CFIUS process, uh, most notably uh, 2007 with FINSA and in 2017 with FIRMA. Today, I invite you to join me to our panel friends in that discussion. First to Mr. Daly, then to the rest of the panel. From your viewpoint, what is the correct balance between national security while also allowing the international investment in our economy? Let's just cut straight to the chase. Well, we have to keep our open investment policy. That's been sustained since, I think, President Carter on through now. Uh, uh, one of the greatest strengths we have as a country is the investment we get from abroad. Uh, Trade is very important, but foreign investment pales it. That said, uh, as you know, sir, uh, in your oversight capacity, uh, there are serious national security issues that are drawn from foreign investment, and Chinese actors have been um, interesting in the way that they've found vulnerabilities, not only in our laws and the gaps that uh, proceed from it, but also in their capabilities to use nefariously third-party actors uh, to gain entrance and access to uh, places where we have one of the spear needs in terms of our national security. So the great balance, I think, is to continue with our open investment policy, but uh, be incredibly smart in how we apply our national security apparatus, especially the CFIUS process. Either of you other gentlemen wish to touch on this? Oh, be brave. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Congressman. Maybe I would just add from a farmer's perspective, from a grower, on two different areas. Um, as a grower and a landowner and, a, and farming land in North Dakota, the concern around foreign investment is real for growers as well. Um, that added investment that uh, outside buyers come, and it's not just, it's not just China, um, it's other you know, out of state and foreign owners that you know, potentially could drive up the cost of land and the cost of producing for a farmer in North Dakota. So there's a concern there. Um, and then I would say on the, uh, on the input side, um, you know, there are, there are for, foreign ownership of research and development facilities when it comes to seed, chemical, and other inputs, uh, research and development facilities that benefit me on the farm when I'm able to use a new and improved product. Um, so in those two areas, I think there's some work to be done probably. Um, and you're right, it's a, it's a tough balance. I don't envy the, the job that Congress has in the administration in finding that right balance, but I think from a grower's perspective, again, two places to look at. Any thoughts, Ambassador? Yeah, most certainly. You know, so, so I'm gonna share my experiences that I've seen globally. Uh, in my time of serving as ambassador, extensive travel throughout the Middle East and a lot in Africa, and then over the years, uh, businesses that we had in Latin America, and I can assure you that the Chinese are aggressive in their approach in investing in a lot of these developing nations to make sure they can secure a food source. I, I look in particular in Africa, they have nearly 1.1 billion hectares of arable farmland. The United States is around 150 million. I can tell you as I travel across Africa, we think that they're the most essential part that, that China is gaming for is the minerals. It's not. Longer run, it's them as their breadbasket. I look into Central America, I see the Belts and Road Initiative, how China's invested there. It's the same goes. And that's why we see the growth in Brazilian soybeans uh, moving into China. The BRIC nations are really forming up together, and it's through the investment of the Chinese party. 
When I come back to the United States, I think we have to be extremely careful of where they do invest. We need to have eyes on this. I, I only gauge you to please be careful. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I can't think of any more important subject than what we're addressing today, and I don't have much time left, but I would say this in closing. I want to thank you, Chairman Thompson, for your support of my legislation, the Agriculture Security Risk Review Act that was signed into law earlier this month. This legislation officially adds the Secretary of Agriculture to the CFIUS Committee. This is the first formal addition of a Cabinet Secretary to CFIUS since 2007 and reflects that what we all on this committee know to be true. A country that cannot feed itself cannot defend itself. And with that, I want to thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Now please recognize for five minutes, Sir Ranking Member Scott. Thank you very much. And Chairman, I want to thank you for letting our Democratic witness, Mr. Cagle, go first. We're proud to hear from a farmer on this issue and such great remarks. But thank you for letting my Democratic colleague go first. And Mr. Tom, I want to just agree with you. You said some profound words. You said the world is watching us today on this very strategic national security issue. And I thank you for that statement, and indeed they are. I've learned so much from so many of my colleagues, but none more than Congressman McGovern on this whole food issue. He's a national world leader on food security and hunger. And I'm telling you, this is a national issue. And I hope that if there's one thing that goes from this hearing is that we are putting this issue at the front of the list. There are people all over the world are watching us. We're the most powerful nation in the world. Yet, as Mr. McGovern has said over and over, we have beds of hunger. Our children, our veterans, people going hungry, needing food. And then we have these threats. I'm not putting any sugar coating on it. I believe there are foreign interests out there who are looking at our nation and trying to find weaknesses wherever they're going. And the one area we must not and cannot get weak in is providing the American people with food and keeping this as our number one trade issue for agriculture and our farmers. And I so appreciate each of you coming forward with this. And Chairman, once again, I just thank you for putting this hearing together because it's timely. Now, let me just ask a couple of questions here. President Cago, in your testimony, you discuss that the 2018 trade war led to Brazil, and I mentioned it in my remarks, capturing additional market share in China and other parts of the world. Now, there has been some discussion of imposing a 60% tariff. Trump, our presidential candidate, has mentioned that on Chinese products. So, I want to ask you, uh, President Cagle, what impact do you think that would have on U.S. soybean production? Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Scott. Um, I, ASA strongly believes that any type of additional tariffs from the U.S. would be bad, not just for agriculture in the U.S., but um, a lot of other businesses as well. It would just lead to, again, knowing that there's a balance and that uh, practices in, in China that, that need to be addressed. But that type of step or that level of tariff or any level of tariff, in 2018, the level was 25%, I believe, if that number's right. Um, and the I mean, we saw almost an immediate drop in the market price for soybeans in particular, close to a $2 drop um, in just a short time after those tariffs were announced and then the retaliation from China. So 
if we're learning anything from history and from the experience we had in 2018, you could expect something similar or even more detrimental when it comes to a price loss for U.S. farmers and soybean producers. Thank you. And Ambassador Tom, you note in your testimony that intellectual property theft is one of the primary threats posed by China, given that China seems unwilling to adhere to WTO rules, what, in your opinion, are some concrete steps that we in Congress can take to protect U.S. agriculture te technology? Certainly. Thank you for the question. Uh, there's been major steps made throughout the industry. We heard of an example earlier today about uh, uh, potential theft on data systems. You know, farmers use extensively much more data today, whether it's uh, the constellation of satellites that are operating their tractors to communicating data algorithms to the computers in the tractor to the seeding. These are all been, have been compromised. Mm -hmm. They've been stolen. Uh, and it probably continues yet today. And then I look at the, the intellectual property on the seed. It's one of the biggest advantages we've ever had. But I know this, the Chinese who didn't have that intellectual in the property in the past have it now. So we will see increased competition because of U.S. innovation. By ye we'll see increases in yields in China of probably 10% on corn here very soon, displacing more U.S. commodity sales. Probably see some of the same in soybeans. Mm -hmm. So the concrete steps we need to take are far reaching much deeper than what we're going today. We need to be asking ourselves, what aren't we considering? We need to bring in the best professionals that understand these data and cybersecurity threats. Because if we don't, they're going to continue to outgame us along the way. But again, we need to make sure we invest in research and development to stay ahead of them and make sure we protect those resources. They spend nearly over $10.4 billion a year mm -hmm. on research. We're, we're only maybe a tenth of that in the public sector. Or excuse me, yeah, the public sector. So we need to make sure we shore up that research and development. If not, we're going to suffer the economic consequences and potential food security around the world. I can tell you in my time with the World Food Program, working with them, we were feeding nearly 150 million people a day around the world at a cost upwards of nearly two years ago, $14 billion. That can't continue. But we know one thing, when people aren't food secure, they migrate, they get caught up in human trafficking, and worst case scenario, they get caught in terrorist activities. So as I said, food security is our national security. Very we need focus on that. Thank you very much, and thank you for that extra minute, Chairman. Uh, appreciate the gentleman. Um, now please recognize uh, Mr. Kelly for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to recognize I have two young and aspiring uh, farmers or ranchers here today, Avery and Aubrey Moore from uh, Laurel, Mississippi. And I offer special congratulations to Avery on her position as Vice President of the West Jones FFA chapter. It's important that we recognize our young and aspiring farmers, and so I really just want to thank them for being here and being interested enough in agriculture to come sit in this hearing. I, I echo what you say, Ambassador Tom, Food security is national security. And the last few years have demonstrated the need for strong domestic supply chains to ensure American farmers have continued access to critical products such as fertilizer and pesticides. In addition to serving on this committee, I'm a member of the House Armed Services and the Intelligence Committee. I promise you, I value the, the security on this, food security is national security, as much as I do on the armed services and the intelligence community. As a result, I'm very concerned about the national security implications stemming from our increasing dependence on the People's Republic of China for their primary ingredients in some commonly used pesticides. One of the factors driving the dependency on the PRC is public policy that encourages the offshoring of these critical tools for agricultural production. For any witnesses on the panel today, do you share my concern about American agriculture's reliance upon China for many of our crop protection tools? Are there steps we can take to encourage uh, us to produce these tools here and reduce our dependency on China and other adversarial countries? 
Certainly, I'd be glad to address that. So, you know, research shows and USDA numbers show that nearly 70% of our critical crop care products come from global resources, most of that from China. These are products that are, as I said, protect our plants from weeds, insects, and diseases. We have offshored them. We have to ask that question first. Why are they offshored? I would say it's because of the excessive regulatory burden we have here in the United States. We need reasonable and durable regulatory systems to function to make sure that we can have these plants functioning either here or with one of our friends and allies around the world. You know, it, it takes time to bring this back. The, these are these critical components that we use to produce crops and feed our livestock and, and take care of our livestock. You're not going to do it overnight. It'd probably take you 10 years to bring the capital back here and build the facilities and hire the people to get this done. It's going to take time. But we've got to start now. And this is why I say we need a national agriculture strategy to support food security in the United States and our economy. If we can't bring these resources back, we will be very, very vulnerable in the future. I, I want to thank, and I'm going to ask another question. Uh, but, but I agree, you know, and we're one of the most giving nations in the world. And I think sometimes people don't understand, we don't just feed our nation, we feed the world. And we're indiscriminate about not just feeding ourselves, but feeding others. And some of our competitors are only worried about their populations and no other populations. For any of the witnesses, do you know if there exists a centralized strategy by the Chinese Communist Party to increase U.S. reliance on Chinese produced fruits and vegetables and if you do, do you know the extent to which China is subsidizing these ongoing threats to our food supply? I have nothing to add on the fruits and vegetables. What I will say is this, and I should have went further on the, on the discussion on the pesticides or the crop care products. Right now, it's estimated that because of the, the declining economy in China, that they're accelerating their production of crop care products and potentially could be dumping those on the market, obviously subsidizing them. So that's one of the risks that I see. In terms of fruits and vegetables, I have no knowledge of that. Thank you, Congressman. Those are excellent questions. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, I really don't, the fruits and vegetables side, I, I do know that you know, China, where it wants to focus resource, will subsidize it. I will say and just add, you know, in terms of inputs to our agricultural dependencies, if you look at some of the vitamins that are necessary for our livestock, whether that be A or B or, or D or E, I mean, we have dependency on China 70 percent to 90 percent. Uh, and, and that sourcing and has just happened over time. You know, gradually, uh, uh, U.S. companies and businesses have seen an advantage of cost-wise to move there. Uh, but we've seen what that causes in terms of our supply chains and dependencies and vulnerabilities. So as ambassador, as the ambassador relayed, we need to find ways to take a thorough examination of our supply chain vulnerabilities, determine where we need to address matters in a, and prioritize them, and then find the resources to do it. Obviously, funding is always difficult, but there are ways to do things without having the funding to make sure you prioritize, you know, in the cyber realm, what, what, you know, in agriculture, what FBI is doing in terms of focusing on ag and, other, and versus other portions. So I think just creating that real thorough analysis, and I know the U.S. Department of Ag uh, and you all are, are doing that oversight to get them focused on those vulnerabilities, especially uh, where it concerns our food supply. I thank the witnesses, and my time has expired, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Now, please recognize my friend from Massachusetts, Mr. McGovern. For well, well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our, our, our witnesses. Thank you for your excellent testimony. And um, I think it's always important to talk about how important food security is to national security. Um, you know, uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of attention uh, in this Congress uh, given to China, and legitimately so. I mean, the security threats. Uh, that opposes the issue, the impact on our food security, on a whole range of things. But sometimes I wonder how serious we are about really addressing uh, those challenges. I mean, last week we did a, a bill to ban TikTok because um, we're concerned about the, uh, data, the privacy of our data. But we did nothing to, uh, to address the security of our data on all these other social media platforms, which China could use a data broker to purchase and get that, get that same information. Um, and, you know, when we talk about 
and, and even on today's topic, I want to make sure that what we're doing is we're, you know, we're really actually doing something that's meaningful, that will actually protect our land and protect our, our, our food supply. Look, I, I, was, I was the co-chair of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission for many years, and for four years I was the chair of the Congressional Executive Commission on China, and I've authored uh, the uh, Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, the Tibetan Policy and Support Act. Uh, I know what it means to act when we have serious disagreements with the Chinese government. Both those uh, bills became law. And I also recognize at the same time that we have a trade relationship with China, um, and that is important. Uh, and we, we want to make clear that we're not, we, we don't want to seek a wider conflict. Uh, so, uh, you know, I feel like I have a little bit of a leg to stand on you know, when I question kind of the, the seriousness of, of much of what we do here. Um, Mr. Daly, I'm not going to, I'm just kind of venting here. I'm not going to ask a question, but I, I, I wanted to say I appreciated the thoughtfulness of your testimony and the expertise you bring to, to this topic. But in your written uh, testimony, you mentioned the 2013 acquisition of Smithfield Foods by what is now called the WH Group, a Chinese company that, as Chairman Gallagher noted in his testimony, has ties to the PRC government. And Smithfield now controls about a quarter, a quarter of all U.S. hog production, and it exports a significant quantity of pork to China, tightening our domestic supply. And I think it's appropriate for this committee <coughs> to carefully consider what impact that has on U.S. food security, uh, which is why it astounds me that we have some of my friends on the other side, uh, you know, uh, led by some on this committee who talked tough on, on China, uh, are carrying the water for Smithfield. Uh, many people listening may be familiar with California's Proposition 12, which is a farm animal welfare law that outlaws the most inhumane confinement of pigs in California. 2022 polling show that 80% of U.S. voters favor a law like Proposition 12 in their state. I'm from Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, we have a similar law known as Question 3, now, pork producers, led by Smithfield, including, you know, were unhappy with the new standards and went to the Supreme Court last year. And they lost. And they lost. So now they've come to Congress to overturn the will of California and Massachusetts and dozens of other states that have followed suit. We have this bill called the EATS Act, which is the latest attempt to overturn states' rights to set their own animal, animal cruelty standards. And now, just last week, um, I heard our chairman uh, tell the news outlet that he wants to, uh, he wants a fix to Proposition 12 in the Farm Bill. We just heard the governor of South Dakota talk about states' rights and how we in um, um, South Dakota, she wants a state CFIUS plan. And, and nobody objected to that. Uh, so if nobody's objecting to a state CFIUS process, why would you object to a state putting controls on uh, animal cruelty? Um, and, um, and again, really at the insistence of this uh, Chinese-owned company. And I, I just, I, 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 you know, I, 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 the, you know, to my colleagues, I think it, it is kind of hip, hip, hypocritical uh, to talk tough about, uh, you know, on, when it comes to the influence of the Chinese government in our food system while actively helping some of the entities that they're supposedly concerned about. So. You can't just care, care about food security when, it, when it's politically useful or suits the business interest uh, that you may be beholden to. It has to be all the time. And I just want to add one other thing, build, uh, based on what Congresswoman Slotkin said. I want to make another point about foreign farmland ownership, which is getting a lot of attention today. You know, I'm, I'm open and, and certainly uh, willing to work with my colleagues on limiting investment of foreign governments in U.S. farmland, but we have to be very careful that those prohibitions do not target people in this country based on their national origin or perceived national origin. And without objection, I'd like to submit into the record a May 2023 article in Just Security by Edgar Chen entitled, With New uh, Alien Land Laws, Asian Immigrants Are Once Again Targeted by Real Estate Bans. So I'll, I'll just close by saying, you know, there was a time in our history where we uh, excluded people from land ownership based on prejudice and unfounded suspicions of disloyalty. I hope we don't go back to that. And again, I thank you all very much for your very informative testimony. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. Uh, without objection, we'll enter that into the record. Gentlemen's time has expired. I will remind you, though, that this is about ties to the Chinese Communist 
party. You know, we're not, as I said in my opening statements, this is not targeting individuals of any ethnic origin. Uh, now pleased to uh, recognize, uh, um, actually, Mr. Finstead for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Thompson and Ranking Member Scott for holding this important hearing today, and thank you uh, to our witnesses for, for joining us. Uh, Mr. Gackle, I want to say thank you. I'm a fourth generation corn and soybean farmer from southern Minnesota, raising the fifth. And uh, it makes me very happy to know we have someone like you at the helm of the American Soybean Association leading our efforts, fighting for our commodities, and quite frankly, fighting for our families and the future of our families. Uh, nothing's going to make uh, my life more complete than watching my fifth generation take over our farm. And that's not for me. That's for grandma and grandpa and great grandma and grandpa. And you're, you're helping that happen. So thank you. Uh, and this issue is so important to that. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, my perspective and, and, and uh, hopefully hear from you. So as a, I understand the importance of, of the threats that we are faced with here with the Chinese Communist Party and what it really does to farm country. And it is time for us to take this serious. We must work swiftly to move, uh, I guess, differently and more effectively of getting uh, most of our eggs out of the basket of China. And uh, the best way to describe this, I will just say, I mean, look at what we went through a few years back when we were struggling to find uh, the computer chips that were needed to start our new F-150s in farm country, our new John Deere tractors. Uh, and I tell people quite often, I'm like, now think if that was eggs bacon, turkey, if we were that reliant from a food security standpoint in regards to, quite frankly, folks that might not like us tomorrow, uh, and how really that shows the importance of the American farmer and how we have to continue to protect and fight for our way of life. Uh, so with that said, there's a lot of ways I think that we can maybe uh, unwind this, but Mr. Ambassador, as you know, the White House's 2023 National Cybersecurity Strategy and the Director of National Intelligence Annual Threat Assessment both emphasized that the People's Republic of China is the most advanced, active, and persistent cyber threat to the United States. Specifically, an increase in cyber attacks targeting the American agriculture and food sector highlights a serious threat to our ag economy. As critical infrastructure sector, do you believe that food and agriculture sec sector is adequately prepared for and possesses the ability to respond to a major cyber attack against our key suppliers in the ag industry? No, we are not. I know we've taken major steps to protect this uh, from a private sector perspective. I appreciate any, any involvement that the government can be on this. I know there's an institute that, at Purdue University called the Kroc Institute that works on a lot of this because we need to make sure we can manage RIP and hold it close. But uh, we're not doing enough yet today. And I add this, if we really think that we're going to see less digital agriculture in the future, we're wrong. It's going to continue to accelerate at a, at a very rapid rate. The velocity will be essential. Yeah, thank you for that, Ambassador. And just in my, you know, short tenure uh, running the farm, my father retired when the tractor started driving itself. My 15-year-old son plants corn till 3 in the morning because of that technology. That technology is an amazing advancement in our, in our farm, but it's also... Uh, poses a potential new threat that we haven't dealt with before. Uh, on, along these lines, Mr. Daly, in January, I introduced the Farm and Food Sec uh, Cybersecurity Act with Congresswoman Slotkin, which would direct the Secretary of Agriculture to conduct a biennial study on cyber threats and vulnerabilities within the ag and food sector and conduct an annual cross-sector crisis simulation exercise. Uh, due to the wide-ranging national and economic security threat threat that China poses to the sector, uh, coordination between federal agencies uh, and sharing timely, actionable threat information uh, with private industry is more critical now than ever. From your perspective, uh, how well is the government sharing threat uh, intelligence with the industry, and do you believe USDA can play an elevated role in helping the ag industry prepare for future threats? Apologize. Thank you, Congressman, uh, for that question. Uh, it's an excellent question. I want to commend you on the legislation you proposed. It's it's critical. Uh, understanding the cybersecurity threats that are part of our agricultural community, our ability to produce is is is, is direly needed. Um, look at my time in government. Uh, 
the intelligence sharing that I saw happen a lot with defense contractors uh, and also within the banking community. So they were industries that sort of had the benefit of that intelligence sharing. Um, but if you look in terms of that intelligence sharing, that cyber awareness in terms of the agricultural community and with the Department of uh, Agriculture, it's been lacking. Uh, and your bill is extremely necessary to get it on the right track. Uh, I know the Department of Ag has just stood up an information sharing uh, division, and they're taking measures to improve that intelligence. Uh, but given China's capabilities, and FBI Director Ray uh, relayed this in terms of their ability to shut off our critical infrastructure, waters, power uh, that affect our farmers and ranchers and producers, uh, we need a full assessment, uh, so your bill goes exceptionally toward that direction. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My time is up. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Now we please recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Langworthy, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate all the witnesses for being here today. I, I represent Western New York and the southern tier counties of New York State along the Pennsylvania line, and I'm deeply concerned about the unrealistic plan proposed by our governor to reduce economy-wide greenhouse gas emissions in New York by 40 percent by 2030 and no less than 85 percent by 2050. Uh, this timeline simply isn't feasible for many industries in rural upstate New York, but what's particularly alarming uh, in this plan is our governor's aggressive push towards electrification in our agriculture sector, an agenda that I believe could have very serious consequences. Uh, as you're all aware, Diesel fuel plays a crucial role in powering the tractors, combines, and other equipment that are essential to our farmers. Uh, farming is a round-the-clock endeavor, as my colleagues have said, in requiring our farmers to rely on more uh, heavily electric charging vehicles uh, ignores the operational realities of farming and the inconvenience of having to park equipment for hours and hours uh, on end to charge. And with all that said, I raise these concerns because it's important to recognize that China's significant role in this sector, uh, particularly the mineral and battery supply chains, as these are crucial components for all EV technology. Uh, if we start pushing an all-electrification agenda at the state and federal levels, uh, we are not only hurting our farmers, we are also inadvertently contributing to China's influence and control uh, of our entire economy. I, I see this as a lose-lose scenario for our farmers, for all of agriculture, and frankly, for our national security. Uh, and with that, uh, Mr. Gackle, uh, could you discuss the feasibility and potential impacts of implementing an aggressive electrification agenda like the one New York State is uh, contemplating, uh, how that would impact your members? And additionally, could you also address whether pursuing such an agenda in the U.S. ag sector might lead to increased dependency on Chinese supply chains? Um, you know, and what that would mean to our national security. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, very good questions and points. Um, I'll speak from my farmer and producer and grower perspective in rural North Dakota. Um, the, uh, there, are, there is a time and a place for electri electrification and electric vehicles, and that's going to probably be more widely adopted on the coast, larger urban areas. But for me as a farmer and as a producer in the middle of North Dakota, um, from the trucking to the tractors, the combines, uh, rail, uh, what we rely on to move product from our farms to our elevators, to our markets. Uh, those types of industries, I think, will probably be later adopters um, when it comes to electrification. Uh, and what we're doing, so what we have to offer in that space is American soy, as farmers, as ASA, uh, you know, the, the uh, significant addition that we provide to the liquid fuels market when it comes to renewable diesel and biofuels. And that just, again, it's another testament of what the U.S. farmer can produce. Um, it's an example of where we're trying to diversify markets and diversify domestic demand, so not so reliant on foreign markets, even while we try to expand those. But again, just a, a, you know, a, a uh, example there of what the American farmer is doing to transition uh, this, this time period in, the tra in that transportation fleet. And then the risk, the risk of d relying on China for uh, the uh, infrastructure or the materials for further electric vehicle adoption. Uh, like any input, anything we rely on from foreign markets, there's always additional risk there if you're not able to produce it domestically. Very good, thank you. Uh, Mr. Daly, I'd like to open this question up to you as well. You know, we often hear that saying food security is national security, and I'm deeply concerned that continuing to rely on China uh, for these critical minerals puts us at a significant risk. 
Uh, Mr. Daly, could you also address whether pursuing an electrification agenda in the U.S. ag sector might lead to increased dependency on Chinese supply chains, thus compromising national security? Thank you, Congressman. That's an excellent question. Um, currently, we're in a large deficit in this uh, particular technology, um, uh, especially given uh, battery technology that uh, China effectively dominates right now. Um, so if we don't get our policy right, uh, we, it creates a serious dependency that uh, creates a real vulnerability in our uh, agricultural uh, production. Um, that's why we need to focus on it. And I know there's a, there's a concerted focus on building out uh, America's capabilities in this respect. Uh, but we just have to put the resources to it. Very good. And, and I know you may have touched on this already, Mr. Daly, but could you reiterate some of the national security concerns regarding Chinese acquisitions of agricultural and other land holdings near our military bases? Sure, absolutely. Again, thank you, Congressman, for that excellent question. Um, as this committee is well aware, the Fufang transaction that happened in North Dakota was uh, a, a serious uh, uh, indication of what China uh, can do in terms of what it wants to do in terms of its placement. Uh, you know, in my experience in, in CFIUS uh, and in CFIUS transactions, there's been a number of significant Chinese acquisitions where they've gone to acquire land or farm land uh, that's near a military facilities, a top gun facilities. A number of transactions occurred in Nevada uh, near uh, that were, you know, under the label of a gold mine that actually was meant to observe our nuclear facilities uh, and capabilities, uh, as well as our uh, in Oregon, a Rawls transaction involving a wind farm. Um, you know, wind farm towers can be used for, uh, devices can be put in there to see what we're doing. Uh, and, that, and the facility they were looking at, the windby uh, that would have given sight to, I mean, that was a critical facility to the United States in terms of what we were doing in defense of Taiwan. So um, they're strategic, they're smart, they've studied us, yeah, and they'll continue perfect. to do so. So we need to remain vigilant uh, in terms of where our resources go. Thank you very much, and I yield back, Mr. Gentleman's time expired. <clears throat> Please recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Costa, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this hearing. Chairman Thompson and Ranking Member Scott, I think it's timely for a lot of reasons that I think we're all aware of. Um, members of this committee have gotten used to me saying, uh, as a third generation farm farmer from California, that uh, food is a national security issue. Uh, I get frustrated, I think, along with many of my colleagues on this committee, that too often the majority of Americans don't look at food being a national security issue because we do it so well with less than 4% of our nation's population directly involved, but it is. And I think it's important uh, that this committee focus on the danger that China poses to America in terms of its impact on American agriculture and therefore food put on America's dinner table every night. Um, let me just kind of give you my thoughts, and then I have a couple questions I want to ask. Um, I really think that the best strategy for this, because China is an adversary, they are a competitor, and they are a vast market. And so regardless of what administration is in office, they have that challenge. This is an adversary. Let's make no mistake about it. Number two, we compete against one another, and I would argue they don't compete fairly. They don't play by the same rules under the WTO, and they're engaged in, in the theft of technology and other types of efforts. Uh, and But yet, they are a vast market. And so how you balance those three factors uh, for any administration is a problem. Uh, you know, the Bush administration, and then followed by the Obama administration, tried an effort that I thought had merit. And that was the Trans-Pacific Partnership, where you engaged other nearby countries to leverage China. I think that's far better than uh, tariffs war that ultimately the last president got engaged in. And why? Well, everybody has leverage on a tariff war, and they, they just keep upping the ante. But if you want to really have an opportunity to deal with this market, if you want to have an opportunity to deal with the uh, factors of competition um, and realizing that this is an adversary, I think uh, the TTP was a far better strategy. Uh, yes, the market access program is helpful to our American farmers and processors, and it's oversubscribed, and I have legislation that would double the funding for that. Whether or not that can come to pass with our challenges with the Farm Bill remains to be seen. Um, so let me just uh, ask you, Mr. Daly, for starters, your testimony focused on China and their engagement on agricultural supply chain. The pandemic, I think we really understood that 
our supply chain is in need of assistance at every level, and especially in agriculture. Um, with biotechnology and plant breeding tools and other potential to help producers meet challenges by reducing greenhouse gases and emissions and foster resilience and climate change in the agricultural supply chain, um, what's your thoughts? I mean, because too often I think China's a bad actor. Uh, they're opaque, they're politically driven in the regulatory system, and it limits innovative technologies um, and, uh, and their theft of American technology. Uh, and I don't even want to start with artificial intelligence and the problems with algorithms and therefore. But besides purchasing United uh, um, Ag Land, and we heard testimony in the earlier hearing, uh, how do you create a fair level playing field? Um, in a minute or less. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Congressman. I will. Um, we have a time problem. It's. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult and it's multifaceted and you just have to take it sector by sector, issue by issue uh, in terms of making it a level playing field uh, with China uh, in terms of uh, we got to, A, be smart in terms of what we address in China. You acknowledge it's not a level playing field. It is not a level playing field. Absolutely. The Chinese have, uh, are, are a state-driven economy. They subsidize where they want to subsidize and uh, they will destroy markets and our U.S. production capabilities where they want. Do you think in the supply chain issues, and for the rest of you, uh, you know, we passed the bipartisan $1.2 trillion investment in infrastructure in the last Congress, and I think when we look at our ports and harbors and we look at our supply chains, California's dairy industry is very dependent upon those feed trains coming in every week to California, uh, but the whole essence of the supply chain and food uh, development, production, value added, that we invest uh, some of that infrastructure in that in our infrastructure? Yeah, I, th I think the, uh, the uh, a number of uh, bills that were passed by Congress in terms of bringing up and strengthening our infrastructure are absolutely critical. There's a lot we have to do in terms of our capabilities there. Ms. Mr. Chairman, my time's expired, but I don't know if any of these other uh, witnesses care to comment about how we um, use uh, to improve our food supply chain and, and, and dealing with the competition of China? Well, I think it's clear. The United States is uh, the reason we're a dominant power in food systems is because of our natural resources. We've got a, a large concentration of highly productive soils. We've got 14,800 miles of navigable waterways, much more than any other nation, Germany or China. And we need to leverage those resources to be competitive in the world space on selling our commodities and crops and food, system, food around the world. When I look at that infrastructure, though, I look at our dams, our locks, our ports. They're aging. And I know the infrastructure bill was supposed to make an impact there. But if you look at the Civil Society Engineers Association, they come out with reports that we really get a D rating on our infrastructure. Well, currently, but I mean, we just provided the funding. We're, we're now ambitiously trying to do just what you say. We're doing it in California. We're rehabilitating a lot of aging infrastructure and water. I don't know if you care to comment. I, my time's expired. I, just quickly, if there's time, Mr. Chairman, just to say uh, the uh, egg community and producers and specifically ASA are actively involved in promoting and advocating for investments in infrastructure, whether it's ports or rail or rivers or dams. The Water Resources Development Act that, that Congress reauthorizes, um, another important tool to, uh, to help farmers and to make sure we have the necessary infrastructure to move our product and move it efficiently and, and uh, sustainably. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, gentleman's time has expired. I've been notified uh, we are in the middle of a vote series. Uh, three votes have been called uh, about 10 minutes ago. So we're going to go to uh, one more question, and then we're going to recess. And, and we will be returning immediately after the third vote. Um, and so I'd please recognize the gentleman from South Dakota, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll start with Mr. Gackle. And uh, I'll note that I'm on the Select Committee on the Chinese Communist Party uh, the, that is le led by uh, Mr. Krishnamurthy and Mr. Gallagher, who we heard from earlier. And I've gotten a little bit of a reputation, Mr. Chairman, on that committee for talking about soybeans all the time, because it is really hard to overstate the role of soybeans 
in this relationship between China and the United States. And Mr. Gackle, that's why I was so pleased that you talked about soybeans, as I think you said, the prime casualty of the 2018 trade war. Uh, in that environment, we know how important diversifying our markets are. I want to be polite to Ambassador Tai because she's brilliant and hardworking. I think it's fair to charitably say that the trade agenda, at least with regard to new trade deals, has been pretty lukewarm for this administration. If you all were going to look at market access, are there specific markets that you think are, are, are ready to pop and that would reduce the amount of leverage that China has over our nation and over soybean growers? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, very good questions, and I'm glad you asked them because there's a lot of work that we are doing in that area. Um, it's important to remember, you know, we are involved in 112 different countries, 112 different markets. When I say we, it's U.S. soy. It's not just ASA. It's other soy partners that we work with. Um, making those investments, trying to find new and emerging markets. We have a program within American Soybean Association, WISH, the World Initiative for Soy and Human Health. Um, it's a very important program, it's, and it partners with farmer invested dollars through the checkoff. But, but what, what markets are ready to take that sure. next leap? I think, you know, South Asia. In Indonesia, um, Japan, Korea, um, there are places there. Uh, I think, you know, North Africa and, and Europe, there's some potential there. There's some uh, regulatory issues with getting more into Europe, but they're a big buyer. Mexico is a big buyer, so there are opportunities in different places. Um, you know, and that's long term. It takes a long time to build a market. So in the short term, to replace the scale of China, just very difficult, but be assured. Well, and let's we are, be honest. We are working. Know. I mean, 60% of South Dakota soybeans go to Asia. Right. China is overwhelmingly the purchaser of those. Of course, replacing the markets, we're all, oh, we're all in on the joke. You're not going to replace that market. But I do think if you reduce the concentration, then that does help uh, uh, make sure that we're not at such a power yep. asymmetry. Ambassador Tom, uh, feed in here. What are your thoughts? Certainly. So, you know, in terms of new markets, I, I agree. The Southeast Asia market is a market we need to look to. We need to look at some of the places in the northern part of uh, South America. Colombia is a good trading partner. Uh, we've got some real problems with Mexico right now. I hope we get those resolved sooner yes. than later. Uh, and I, I'll say this as well. Uh, there's quite a bit of work going on in Africa. I agree. We have to diversify our customer base. I think we're already on the road to losing more of our market share into China. We have to be aware of that. I don't know if we can get in front of it. We need to do what we can to retain that trade, but we cannot sacrifice our own national security and our food security in our own country. So we got to make sure we stay on top of that. Well, and I would just note, Ambassador, you're exactly right. And, and this, we should all be underlining the importance of American soft power. When we talk about the global south, when we talk about Southeast Asia and Africa, we cannot allow unfettered Chinese leadership in those areas. People, they understand the almost a deal with the devil they are making in the Belt and Road Initiative or in other Chinese deals. They are looking for American leadership. And unfortunately, too often, uh, America is uh, receding back into ourselves a little bit. I'm sure you've seen the same numbers I have, Mr. Ambassador. In public opinion surveys in Africa, more respondents will say they view China as the leader of the world than America. That is a major problem. Uh, I interrupted, sir. Other thoughts on that topic? Yeah, in terms of Africa, yeah, we, we give actually, we put more money into Africa than China does, but we don't ask anything in return. Yeah. China will always go in and do something, whether the, the World Bank came in and gave a loan to a certain particular nation. They default on that loan. China comes in and creates a debt spiral on it. Then they end up getting mineral resources and other resources that the country has in turn, and taking on that loan too at a very big discount. So we do have a threat of them continuing to ask for something every time they go to a nation. We ask for nothing. Thank you very much. I wish I had another five minutes, but my time is uh, running low, Mr. Chairman, and I would yield. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the committee stands in recess to immediately, immediately after casting the third vote in this series. The committee will reconvene my uh, appreciation and... Uh, and, and quite frankly, I'm thankful for your tolerance with uh, uh, the recess that we did for the three three vote series. And I'm pleased to recognize the gentlelady from Connecticut, Congresswoman Hayes, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Over the past few decades, China has significantly broadened its economic and political influence, especially in the agricultural sector. The Belt and Road Initiative is a massive China-led infrastructure project that aims to stretch around the globe. The project has expanded to Africa, Oceania, and Latin America in the decades since its inception. According to the American Enterprise Institute, China Global Investment Tracker, China has invested nearly $77 billion in foreign agricultural products between 2013 and 2023. Currently, 783 million people across the globe are facing chronic hunger and growing more and more dependent on the agricultural structures developed by China. Ambassador Tom, during your time with United Nations agencies, you saw firsthand the importance of global food security. Why is it important for the United States, rather than China, to lead the world in solving global food security? When I look at participation, first of all, I, I served the State Department, the United States of America, and the President of the United States. I didn't work for the World Food Program, but I did have oversight over them. Uh, to answer your question, I understand why the Chinese are doing what they want to do to improve their food security. I mean, I think they've been through the last uh, century a couple famines that uh, have affected. And we, we've seen where famines can turn governments around. There's a French Revolution, and there's one happened in, in Russia, obviously, and many others. But the reality is they're going to continue to invest, and they want to make sure that they capture as much U.S. innovation to accomplish their goals as they can, and they don't want to pay for it. So what are some best practices that we can implore to build trusting relationships with other countries? I, I think what we've got to do is, uh, you know, first of all, I believe we need to diversify our trading partners. That's one thing we need to do. Uh, best practices would also include uh, making sure that we have the foreign ag service at the USDA, uh, representing all of our agricultural commodities and products, travel the world and make sure that we continue to increase exports of our products here. Thank you. Our leadership at the international level depends on our relationships with our allies and those who look to us for guidance. I've long been a supporter of programs like Food for Progress to support U.S. commodities and developing democracies who are working to build their agricultural uh, sectors. If these programs and collaborations with developing countries were, were underfunded, can we expect China to step into that role? No, they will not. Uh, if you watch, look at funding uh, from China uh, and food security issues, uh, in one hand, they'll tell you they're the second largest economy in the world. On the other hand, they'll say we're a developing economy. We can't contribute to solving world hunger. Uh, the U.S. plays anywhere from 40 to 60 percent of the World Food Program budget, which, like I said over a year ago, is around $14 billion. If we can do anything, it's we need to create resilience and capacity in food systems, but it needs to be driven by the private sector, not the U.N. organizations. The private sector holds the, the IP, the knowledge, the capacity financially, and the ability to improve food systems, and that's where we really need to support growth in food systems. Thank you. I listened to the last panel and this, and this panel as well, and I think one thing is clear. We have to discuss food policy as part of any national security conversation. Anyone who's watched this committee for more than 30 seconds know that hunger, food security, uh, feeding programs, those are issues that are near and dear to me, and they're not just about charitable uh, responses. It literally is national security. So I thank you all for being here today. Mr. Chair, I yield back. General lady yields back. Now please recognize the general lady from Illinois, uh, Ms. Miller, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you all for being here today. I'm so glad to see that this topic is getting the attention that it deserves. Uh, so last year at the beginning of Congress, the first bill I introduced was to ban China and our adversaries from purchasing U.S. farmland. I'm extremely concerned about the loss of production agriculture in the United States. We are losing fertile farmland to solar panels because of the Green Bad Deal, and our adversaries are buying up our farm ground. As a farmer myself, it's extremely important to me that we're preserving the family farm for the next generation and not letting China buy our farmland and cover, or covering it with solar panels. 
Ambassador Tom, I know your concern with China's growing influence in Africa, especially in their agriculture industry. Can you talk more about how you see this as a threat to the U.S. food security? Yeah, I, I see it as a threat in a number of ways. Obviously, you know, we, we want to restrict as much Chinese ownership of our land as we can. We need to make sure that uh, there's many ways that they can have the ownership of this land through uh, different structures that hides the identity of who actually is involved in that process. So we need to do a better job there. I'm not sure USDA has the resources today, maybe they do, to accomplish that. But to your point, We've lost 150 million acres of arable farmland in the United States since the early 1980s. 150 million. Today we're using, losing at the rate of almost 1,800 acres an hour. Wow. It's accelerated during the stimulus bills that came out. But I also look at this. I look at the, in, how much land the federal government has control of as well. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that the America Farmers still has the access to the land that we need to have to produce the food, fiber, and energy, not only for the United States, but for the world. Absolutely, and I want to say that I'm here to represent food production and to defend our ability to feed ourselves. Do you think this poses a similar threat to our energy sector as China's actions in Africa also allows them to monopolize critical mineral production? I've seen it all across Africa. A year ago, I was in Sudan, and we saw the Wagner Group. We saw China. Uh, I've, I've traveled extensively throughout Africa, and that theme continued everywhere I went. And uh, the, the conditions people were working in, the mining of materials, I think they control like 65, 70 percent of those critical minerals. Mm -hmm. And, of course, take them back to China, process them, and then sell them to the United States for solar panels to take away farmland in the United States. We just lost 600 acres this last winter uh, to solar panels. It's gotta stop. Absolutely. You know, the crops we were producing were, were sinking as much carbon as those, carbon pa those solar panels are probably gonna produce in terms of changing the climate. So we need to pay attention. I also have a bill to prohibit solar panels from going on class A and class B farm ground. Do you think that the left's push uh, for, quote, more green energy is making us more reliant on China since we need critical minerals to produce solar panels. There's no question that that's all a part of it. The thing is, I think what we need to look at is, is what are the costs to implement these policies to bring green energy to the United States? You know, it comes at a large cost to obviously construct solar panel fields, the wind turbines, all these different things. And I'm all about saving the environment. I'm all about doing what we can to protect the world we live in today. But the reality is, not only are we gonna pay through this through incentives to put these solar farms in, mm -hmm. but at the same time, that energy is gonna be much more expensive. So whether it's energy or food, these climate initiatives are gonna be inflationary to food cost and energy cost, mm -hmm. and it will affect those that can least afford it the most. Yes, and everything goes back to energy. China's human rights record is terrible. We don't need to do things to strengthen them. And we all know that they're opening a coal-fired plant every week while we're being driven to these uh, policies that make energy uh, unaffordable and unreliable. And then not only that, taking our productive farm ground out of production. Um, this is a critical national security issue, and we cannot let China take control of our farm ground or our energy sector. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jelly yields back. Now please recognize Dr. Adams for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Thompson, and also to the ranking member. To our witnesses, thank you very much um, from, from both panels. Actually, we had an earlier panel. I do want to get clear on one thing because I worry that we're getting our timelines uh, wrong. Uh, the tenor of today's testimonies uh, seem to suggest that China's entry into the U.S. farmland market was the beginning of agricultural consolidation and, and small farm exclusion. However, decades of corporate concentration in the food system are missing from the conversation. Uh, a brittle bottleneck food supply was, was the norm even before China came into the picture. For example, uh, Mr. Tom mentioned that the world's biggest meat packer, J JBS, a Brazilian company, and the cyber attack it faced, uh, which was done by Russia, Russia, by the way, 
and it halted slaughterhouse activity here with severe ramifications across the supply chain. A more dis uh, dis distributed and diverse supply chain would be much less vulnerable to such attacks. We've also heard a lot today about Smithfield's uh, takeover by China as if it wasn't already the world's largest pork producer when it was an American company. Uh, this is in addition to what Governor Noam raised um, earlier about chemical fertilizer and processing companies being brought up. Uh, brought up. And, and Mr. Gallagher mentioned Kim China's owning of uh, Syngenta as creating an untenable dependency. If it's interesting, it's interesting to me that it is a burdensome regulatory environment that Mr. Tom identifies as a source of China's attempts to build its dominance. When 100 years of, of poorly enforced antitrust laws, or a lack of regulation, has concentrated our food system so much that it has now become its most vulnerable to foreign threats. And so uh, having said that, uh, my first question uh, for the panel, if you could briefly respond, is do you believe that, that market concentration or vertical integration is a threat to national security? Each of you. I'll start out, I guess. Uh, you know, I'm a family farmer. I'm seventh generation. Our family's been in this country 10 generations. We've been farmers ever since. And yes, we have grown. We've been successful. We've invested. We've taken risk. Some not times, not always the best risk. We have failed. But at the end of the day, we're a family farm. Are we larger? Yes. But it's because we took those risks and we were successful. We also worked hard. So yes, consolidation has taken place, but there's, there's plenty of room for all size of farmers in the United States. Right. That's what I like. I, can, I started with nothing. Okay. I came into the family farm and I grew my own acres. I bought my own equipment. I took the risk. I took out bank loans. I took out a farm service agency loan to buy my first farm. But we've grown over time. Okay. Farming it requires a lot of capital and it requires a lot of people, but it also requires a lot of investment and education to make sure you're a viable enterprise. Thank you. Gentlemen, yes, sir. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, it's very complex and complicated, and I agree uh, with Mr. Tom that, you know, there's going to be all sizes of farms, and relatively speaking, when it comes to consolidation, uh, you know, there'll probably be winners and losers to that. But uh, rural America, and it's a little bit different than it is in Indiana, in North Dakota than it is in Indiana, of course. Um, but, uh, you know, to the extent that uh, consolidation um, leads to uh, you know, further, you know, loss of certain size farms in different parts of the country, uh, that could be something that would cause some concern, but I, th I think, you know, you're right. It's a, uh, our egg system is going to require all sizes in all places, more than likely. Thank you. Would you like to comment, sir? Oh, I agree with the gentleman uh, here. Uh, uh, both being farmers, they know on the ground uh, okay. the importance of this issue that you raise and, and how it should be balanced and uh, approached. Okay, let me move on real quickly. There are valid concerns about speculative land ownership driving up farmland prices in a way that it's already forbidding people in this country who want to, to own land or, or to order uh, to farm from doing so, mainly uh, black, indigenous, and other farmers of color and new and beginning farmers, and so I have a Justice for Black Farmers Act that would require the Secretary of Agriculture to conduct annual reporting about corporate land investment and ownership. Um, so would you say that we have comprehensive tracking of land ownership in the U.S.? Anybody can answer this, I've got two seconds. Uh, are we tracking land ownership in the United States? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, in terms of, I mean, the Department of Agriculture has a process of tracking sort of farmland acquisitions and ownership, and obviously the GAO, per this committee's uh, leadership, uh, was instructed to see if they're doing it right, and there's improvements that have to be made. Thank you very much. I'm out of time. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. General A. yields back. Now recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Rose, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thanks to Ranking Member Scott, uh, and thank you to our witnesses for your time and indulgence with our schedule today. I'll go ahead and dive right in. Um, Ranking Member uh, Krista Morthy's uh, written testimony stated that 
agricultural technology is a prime target of intellectual property theft because American technology and farming are the best and most productive in the world. Ambassador Tom, can you elaborate on specific examples that you're aware of uh, where recent of, of recent intellectual property theft attempts or successes by China in the agricultural sector? Well, certainly. I, I think in the world we live in today, whether it's uh, your banking, uh, whether it's your Amazon account, or whatever it may be, we've constantly got to be altering and, and modifying and improving our systems to protect our data and our intellectual property. And when I look at, I'll give you an example. Uh, as I stated in my opening testimony, you know, we've had seeds stolen. Uh, they will continue to find out new ways to do it. I think we need to get more creative and try to understand how they're doing this. But when I look at what we're doing on the farm today, the level of data that we produce on a farm to increase productivity, make sure we lessen our carbon footprint, make sure that we use less fuel, less fertilizer, less seed, everything we need to do, those are proprietary algorithms. And with China's investment now in IP, in the seeds, and their access to fertilizer and chemistry, they're going to continue to try. But they've got to get, they, they want to get hold of our IP of how we produce it on our farm to improve productivity. One example, I'll give you this. When I first arrived to Rome, I went to a diplomatic event. The Chinese ambassador came up to me with a piece of paper. And he said, do you recognize these fields? And I said, yes, I sure do. Those are my fields back in Indiana. He goes, I just wanted to ask. That was a shot across the bow. That really wake, woke me up to understand that they have access to more than we think. And Ambassador, looking ahead, what long-term investments can the U.S. foster or policies can we adopt to maintain our edge in agricultural technology and mitigate the threat of Chinese dominance in this critical sector of the economy? Yeah, well, it's like I said in my one comment earlier, uh, China's spending about $10.2, $10.4 billion a year in research and development. Today, we leave most of that up to the private sector, which is good. But I think we need to see more collaboration between a university system and extension. And we need to invest more in research and development between the private and public and our universities, our land grants, to make sure we remain competitive. If we don't, we're going to see increased productivity in China that's going to supplant our markets around the world. Thank you. Uh, shift gears. Mr. Daly, in your written testimony, you mentioned that China restricts nearly all foreign investment into its agricultural sector unless companies incorporate in and share data with China. Can you elaborate on how this lack of reciprocity in market access disadvantages American agricultural companies and how a policy of reciprocity could help level the playing field. Thank you, Congressman, for that question. It's uh, very important. Yes, um, I think we have to really consider a policy of reciprocity in terms of what actions China does, uh, in terms of U.S. investments in, the, in its country, and what we should do on the counter side, on this side of the aisle. Um, and I think it's smart engagement with, with China to be honestly be able to engage them and to say, uh, look, you have these policies that restrict our investors and our capabilities. So we're just putting those measures in place on this side. So I think it's a smart policy that should pervade uh, the agricultural space as well. Sure. And then and finally, uh, Mr. Gacky, in the time remaining, I mean, obviously you, you recognize that the target is kind of squarely on soybean producers in this country in terms of being kind of caught between the motions of, of what we do and what China does. Um, and, and, and we talked before uh, that we restarted. Um, as, as the soybean industry thinks in the U.S., if, as you think about the challenges from China, well, if you had one takeaway for us today about what we need to be thinking about, what, what would that be? Uh, to two, just one in 15 seconds. Uh, I think the important thing to recognize, and I mentioned it in my oral comments and in conversations here today, but uh, we are working hard to diversify and find new markets. We as U.S. Soy, um, and that work will continue on, uh, but it takes time, it takes years, it takes decades to build those new relationships, and the scale of China being what it is, um, and just the demand there for U.S. Soy and for protein, or for soy, I shouldn't say, but for soy in general. If they don't get it from us, they'll get it somewhere else. 
Thank you. And I, my time's expired. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chair. The almost time has expired. Now, I uh, recognize the gentlelady from Virginia, Mrs. Spanberger, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. Um, I am a former CIA case officer, and as such, I do understand the threats posed by the Chinese Communist Party's aggressive influence campaigns, as well as its attempts to target U.S. national security interests through seemingly innocuous transactions. Uh, and as the only Virginian on the Agriculture Committee, I am committed to protecting our Commonwealth's farms and farm families from our adversaries. As you all well know, the Chinese Communist Party's attempt to control American farmland go beyond mere investment. They represent a strategic maneuver to gain leverage over critical aspects of our economy and food production. And this control can lead to compromised agricultural practices, exploitation of natural resources, and unfair competition against American farmers. Uh, that's why I was proud to lead the Bipartisan Protecting America's Agricultural Land from Foreign Harm Act. The bill recognizes the threats posed not just by the Chinese Communist Party, but also by Russia, Iran, and North Korea. Buying up American farmland can be a tool for eroding our nation's food security, economic security, and national security, and we need to take steps to push back against these efforts. If there's time permitting, I have a couple questions about CFIUS, uh, but Mr. Gackle, I'd like to begin with you. Um, as uh, a Virginian, um, I represent many, uh, um, many soybean farmers. Uh, one of Virginia's top agricultural exports is soybeans. And just last week I was speaking with a producer who mentioned that while he sells the, the bulk of his soybeans to China, uh, it concerns him, uh, the, the shifts in the global soy market. Um, and he is, like so many other Virginia producers, uh, still impacted by the shifts in the market that occurred because of the, the trade wars initiated some years ago. So you've mentioned how maintaining trade relationships with China is important for the success of America's soybean industry. Um, and I would first ask, you know, as in, in response to my colleague's question, you were talking about diversification, diversification of markets. Um, do you have any suggestions for how Congress could help American soy producers uh, as they seek to gain access to diverse markets? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, a few examples from in congressional action and things that we have been advocating for for a long time, uh, and I mentioned it earlier um, in a couple of the other Q and A's and in my in my both written and oral testimony. Um, but funding through the Farm Bill, as Congress continues to consider passing a reauthorization of the Farm Bill, funding in the trade and market expansion space is uh, very important. Uh, Had several meetings. Our Many of our growers were here last week on the Hill and may have met with you as well That's right. and met with many of you in advocating for increased money in the MAP and FMD programs uh, that, as I mentioned earlier, has been uh, stagnant for several years, the level of funding there. Um, so doubling of market access program funds and foreign market development increasing in those funds as well. Um, just critical in finding those new markets and providing some long-term uh, certainty for the availability of funds. They are oversubscribed which yes. has been mentioned earlier. So there is certainly demand. I think soy and other commodities show pretty consistently that we can, <laughs> there's a great return on investment with those dollars as well, um, bringing back to the farm. Uh, so I think that would be one area that Congress could look at, you know, ensuring some more certainty. And for, for some of my colleagues who might not have uh, met with any of your uh, member producers who were on the Hill last week, uh, and certainly my conversations were, were excellent to this topic, could I just talk through a little bit about why uh, that funding matters. Um, would you say that it is as as much as you and and your fellow producers endeavor to you know produce the best product that you can, uh, having the support of the U.S. government in helping to market, establish new markets, make clear the value of that American product, are all things that that you all you're producing the product, but that boost uh, is something that's of, of value to you. Is that a fair assessment, and would you is. add to that? Yes, yes, for sure. And uh, I think what it demonstrates to our uh, to our foreign buyers and markets outside of China, but to the new markets we're trying to develop, is we have a unique public-private partnership here in the U.S. to uh, to invest farmer dollars through the checkoff with mm -hmm. MAP and FMD dollars, um, and again showing that tr tremendous return on investment when those programs are combined. And particularly, um, you know, when, when you are looking at 
the challenges and the risks that, that uh, soybean farmers have faced over the past couple of years. Uh, in the final time, is there anything that you want to make sure that members of this committee under, understand uh, as we head into kind of finalizing this farm bill? Well, say the last part again, the final. As, as we head into finalizing this, this farm bill. I think, okay, yeah, I would uh, thank you for the question. Just farmers, like most businesses, are trying to reduce risk, manage risk, provide some certainty to their operations, their family farms, their businesses. Um, and I think short-term extensions of the existing farm bill provide some certainty, but not the level of certainty that's needed over time. So a, a full reauthorization sooner rather than later in, um, in this calendar year in this Congress would be helpful. I think on that we are all aligned. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank the gentlelady. Now, pleased to recognize Dr. Baird from Indiana for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I really appreciate uh, all you witnesses being here. We always learn something that's uh, very useful um, for decision-making purposes as we talk about the Farm Bill. So I'm going to start uh, with another Hoosier that has quite a presence in the state of Indiana. And so, Mr. Ambassador, um, uh, I would like, you know, you made reference that we need to expand our markets into other markets, and you certainly have a, a, a tremendous knowledge in that area. So can you expand on that, what other countries and so on that we might be interested in? Yeah, I mean, I, I think USDA is, is, is now starting to get out. I've, I've heard of a number of trade missions that have taken place uh, over the past six months uh, into Africa to discover if there's some opportunities. It all comes down to funding. Do they have the money to buy the, the basic raw ingredients, whether it's a commodity of soybean, corn, wheat, flour, rice, whatever it may be, do they have the money to buy it? And I think that's the biggest thing that has to be developed there. But I come back home and I say, what can we do here in the United States of America to find more value-add opportunities for the crops we produce, because we're going to continue to grow yields, hopefully. And as we do that, and if we lose some markets or we have some diminishing markets because of other places like Brazil and Argentina coming on and supplying China, we better find a way to use up this crop. I mean, I think biofuels have been very good for the industry, have been good for the environment, been good for our economy. But we need to continue to look further. I know sustainable aviation fuel seems to be slowed down a little bit. But at the end of the day, we need these products. We need these opportunities to make sure that we have a vibrant economy. But again, value add is what we need to be doing. I really don't want to export a kernel of corn or a bean. I want to add some, some value to that before it leaves the shore of the United States. Because it creates jobs and creates employment. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, you know, I've, I've said uh, quite often, because uh, agriculture is my background, but, you know, uh, this, this country does such a wonderful job in quality of product, and then we have the logistics to be able to get it to anywhere in the world. And I think that's a real asset and a, market, a marketing tool for us, too, as well as what you just said, and what you said was extremely important. Uh, but I want to switch over now to... Um, uh, to Mr. Gackle, uh, in technology, science, and research is kind of my background, and I'm a strong advocate of that. And now China, you know, is trying to take over the world. And you, I go back to the time when I was at Purdue, and I know we went down to Brazil to show those folks how to raise soybeans for what was called humanitarian reasons. And uh, so then I remember a professor coming back and I asked him how that was going, and he said extremely well. He called me Jimmy, but he says extremely well because he said the, the only problem is those soybean fields have armed guards around them. So we really didn't do much to help the humanitarian efforts in that area. What we did do, though, is we taught them how to raise the soybeans, and then they went on the world market. So I guess I'm just really asking what your thoughts are on how much we should invest in research, uh, how much, how important technology is going to be uh, to improving our productivity. Thank you, Congressman, for the question. Uh, it fits in well here. And I, I'll just start out by saying technology and adoption of new technologies on our farms and on the farm I work, you know, I come from in North Dakota, but farms across the country just 
more and more important in being efficient and uh, reliable producers and sustainable, financially sustainable in the long run to have those technologies and those tools. Um, the information that we're able to gather as growers uh, to, to help us make better decisions each year as we're planting a new crop and harvesting a different crop, the, the information we get back from that technology is just uh, essential in making those decisions. Um, and then it, when it comes to just operating our, our operations efficiently um, and reducing the reliance on inputs, we talk about, well, if we're too reliant on domestic or uh, foreign production of chemicals and fertilizers and seeds and anything else, uh, farmers, we're pretty, not pretty, very <laughs> a strong consideration in what it's costing, the cost of production for our crops. And so these types of things, and there's certainly concerns around data privacy and use of that data and who does a belong to, you know, it's just, it, it's farmer information, so we really want to make sure that we protect that as well. I got one last question for you. Do you, we talk about precision agriculture, do you have one of those planters that you can plan 10 or 11 mile an hour and still get well, it? Well, sir, that's a great question. You know, I, you'd, you'd be interested to come to my part of North Dakota and know that even if I did, I probably couldn't use it because we have some other obstacles in the way. I hear you. Thank you very much. Gentleman yields back. Now, please recognize the gentlelady from Ohio, Congresswoman Brown, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One thing we know to be true on this committee is that food security is national security. As a member of the Select Committee on Strategic Competition with the Chinese Communist Party, I know there is bipartisan concern and consensus on addressing the CCP's entanglement in our agriculture industry. The Select Committee heard firsthand testimony on the CCP's efforts to unfairly steal agriculture technology and products, including genetically modified seeds. American innovative technology and intellectual property is not up for grabs. And the CCP needs to engage honestly with the world's global food and farm economy. At the same time, the CCP is attempting to monopolize the global agriculture supply chain, putting the US and our allies at a disadvantage. The food agriculture sector is one of 16 designated critical infrastructure sectors in the US. That is partly why I introduced the bipartisan Critical Supply Chains Commission Act to examine and identify gaps in our supply chain and reduce our reliance on any outside nation to provide the critical materials we need, including agricultural products. So Mr. Daly, the United States has been losing its ability to manufacture agricultural inputs, including vitamins, animal feed, and pesticides. Can you talk a little bit about why we are seeing this and what are some of the things that we can do to address this? Yeah, I, I think in terms of why we're seeing it, I just think the evolution of, of where the industry got, went in terms of pricing is why uh, things moved to China as it did in terms of vitamins and, and whatnot. But it's created an incredible dependence, as, as you well know, Congresswoman. And so in the vitamin space, you know, 80 to 90 percent of productions happens in China. So we need to move that back. And I think your bill is exceptional in what it wants to do take a look at these supply chains, uh, see where our vulnerabilities are, and then figure out solutions to them. And the solutions are uh, a focus on resources, uh, moving government resources in the right direction, and then ensuring that we're either putting it here in the United States or putting it in a, a friend-shoring uh, 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 situation where we can depend on the supply. Thank you so much. And I'd like to continue with you or Ambassador Tom with the next question, which is what recommendations do you have to protect American intellectual property, specifically in the agriculture space? Sure, I can start with and then go to the Ambassador. Uh, I think the resources need to be uh, put there. Uh, uh, as I said earlier today, there was a lot of intelligence sharing that's happened for a long period of time with the Defense Department. Uh, industries that work with the Defense Department and also our banking industry had a lot of intelligence sharing with the U.S. government. I saw that in Treasury. I think that intelligence sharing resource has to go to the Agricultural Department now. Uh, I know they've stood up uh, a new entity that's going to be doing more sharing of intelligence. There's obviously logistical issues with sharing it in terms of uh, sources and whatnot. But I think as 
the Department of Agriculture gets more familiar with that back and forth with industry and trust, uh, you will be able to build a system where we can have more responsive engagement with industry and address the national security matters. Ambassador? My response to that would be that, you know, I've never seen any service or activity that can't be done better by the private sector than the government. And so I believe it's up to the private sector to work to make sure that we can protect this intellectual property. Certainly welcome any support we can get from the federal government or state governments, but the reality is it's up to us to work hard to make sure that we're protecting this IP, whether it's data, whether it's uh, genetics, whether it's chemistries. I want the private sector to work on this because I think they're best positioned and best able to meet that need. Thank you both. It is abundantly clear that our national security is dependent upon a safe, resilient food system. I look forward to continuing to work on these important issues with my colleagues. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield my remaining time. Generally yields back. Now recognize Mr. Feenstra for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Thompson, and thank you, witnesses, for for being here today. You know, this is a, a, a topic that that we really need to address, and I'm so grateful that you're here. Uh, I wanna play off uh, Dr. Baird and what he said when it comes to intellectual property and what's going on. You know, and I'm from Iowa, uh, probably the district that has the most corn and soybeans growing anywhere in the nation. Uh, we, our land sells for about 30,000 an acre, at least it did about uh, several miles from my house a couple months ago. One shocking story from my, from my state, and Representative Gallagher noted this, that a, a, a person was spotted in a field in Iowa digging up hybrid corn seeds and was eventually uh, found out that they were sending these corn seeds back to China. Uh, this PRC national was later arrested and admitted that he was involved in a long conspiracy to steal trade secrets from our two major U.S. seed companies. And you think about it, it can cost nearly $100 million to have these new hybrids come about. I mean, it takes time and years and all this stuff, and here they're trying to steal them. Uh, Mr. Gackle, uh, can you talk about, yeah, obviously we know the dangers, right? We know, we know China poses this risk, but how can we, and it's so difficult, how, how can we prevent some of this I, IP theft? Well, it says, you know, the group has been discussing today, and uh, the, those of us amongst the table, I think, there's quite a bit of unanimity here on some of those steps that can be taken. Um, I, you know, American Soybean Association, and I personally as a farmer, recognize how complex and difficult these issues are, but you're correct, um, the solutions are hard to find. I think it's, uh, I gave an example of public-private partnership when it came into investing in new markets. I think it could be similar on this side of issues as well when it comes to data protection and IP. Um, and other um, actions that are viewed negatively from China. You know, how can the public sector and the private sector, whether it's seed companies, universities, government, um, find ways to address those complex issues and bring some solutions forward that, I mean, for me as a farmer, it does no good for those, it does mean no good either for those situations to, um, to, to be possible or occur. So yeah, looking yeah. for solutions from our side as growers. I, well. I agree, uh, Mr. Gackle. I mean, it, it's a partnership, private public, and from, from our uh, universities to, to our, our companies, you name it. Uh, but it, it's very worrisome uh, to, to see what's happening. And could you expound on that, Mr. Daly, just a little bit? I mean, what are trends that you're seeing uh, in this area? So expounding on it a little bit, I think it, What's informative is some of the service I had. I remember when I was at the National Security Council and uh, uh, dealing with trade matters, and we'd get intelligence uh, that would come from our intelligence agencies on trade issues that were going on with our counterparts, and it was really lacking. Uh, they just didn't have the experience. The intelligence agencies didn't have the experience to be able to go in and focus on that kind of intelligence. So obviously, it was mixed with defense and other matters. So I think uh, at, over time, they got good at it. So I think it's a matter of applying, uh, as you've done here, with a focus on it that's right. uh, for our intelligence folks, whether that's at Justice, FBI, or NSA, yep. uh, focusing that resource on what is needed here uh, to address these IP thefts and guard against uh, uh, the taking yep. that's happening. I, I agree. I, I want to pivot just a little bit uh, to you, Ambassador Tom. Um, in my district, uh, you know, we, we grow a lot of corn and we grow a lot of, we have a lot of pork. Uh, and when, when China has 6% uh, of uh, the pork and beef markets and then a tremendous amount of our soybeans go and our corn, you name it, uh, this becomes a bit of a problem. Uh, I, 
I, you mentioned Africa a while ago that we got to diversify. We all understand we have to diversify. Our, our biggest problem with going into Africa is the infrastructure, supply chain infrastructure. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit? I mean, I, I think of our dairy, I think of our pork industry, our, our cattle industry. You need refrigeration. Um, if we're going to go into Africa and other countries, and, and as you noted, that it, it's really you know, their next step of, of the, on that food chain of what they want to buy. Uh, can you talk just a little bit about that, Ambassador, of, of what are the obstacles of us getting into some of these countries? Yeah, well, first I'll start, start out by saying that, uh, you, you know, your point about the livestock and the, the amount of exports that we have, whether it's beef, pork, or poultry, uh, mainly pork and beef, though, that's going into China, we've seen exponential growth in those two areas. And I mean, the U.S. producers benefited from that and continues to benefit from that. But again, they're trying to replace us on the pork side at least. Uh, When I look at Africa, I look at infrastructure, yeah, it's very lacking. There is no cold supply chain. We've seen very little investment uh, in many, many countries across Africa. You know, I was just in Sudan, as I said, uh, about a year ago. Uh, They're building some toll roads, private companies are, and everything else. But the reality is, once you get into the interior of the country, whether it's there, Tanzania, Niger, Burkina Faso, there is no infrastructure. No, exactly right. There is no infrastructure. And this is where, you know, what what we were supposed to be doing at the Food and Agriculture Organization is creating resilience and capacity in food systems, but it hasn't happened. No, no. No, and I, I, I just want to quick note this. I got a fridge act that sort of goes down this path that we can use some of these dollars from, um, from the different export uh, things that we have, uh, FMD and so forth. But with that, I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. Now, please recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Salinas, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panelists for being here today. Um, As we think about the impact of China on the competitiveness of U.S. farmers, I think it's also important that we remember that our nation's agricultural economy doesn't really stop just in our fields. In fact, our nation's food and beverage industry is among America's largest domestic manufacturing sectors, and that includes food processing and canned food staples that millions of Americans rely on every day. I'm proud that my home state of Oregon plays an important role in this industry, being a critical supplier of canned fruits in particular. This industry definitely sees the impact of China as well. The China Canned Food Industry Association proudly touts record-breaking growth for Chinese exports to the United States, threatening thousands of U.S. food manufacturing jobs and economic activity in states all across the country, obviously including Oregon. Further, consumers may not even be aware that canned goods they're purchasing are produced in China. In some instances, American-grown canned goods are mixed in with Chinese-grown products and sold under the same label, making it difficult for consumers to know what and the sources of their purchases. And this question is for the whole panel. What policy steps would you suggest to bolster U.S. farmers, reward manufacturers who rely on American-grown and processed ingredients, and ensure consumers know where the food they eat is actually grown? Well, we know there's always been a lot of country of origin labeling that's taken place to really understand, but we're not going to say that the Chinese play by fair rules. Let's face it, it doesn't happen. Uh, in terms of some of the food processing, yeah, I, I understand your concerns. I was recently in Alaska, spoke at a conference up there, and uh, the amount of fish that is being shipped out of Alaska for further processing in China and then back to the United States is substantial. And you ask yourself, why can't we do it here at home? What is the, what is the headwind that's stopping us from doing that? So whether it's fish, whether it's soybeans, whether it's uh, some other protein product, we need to figure out how we can create the value-add opportunities here at home, creating the jobs for the U.S. citizens. Thank you. Mr. Daly? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I absolutely concur uh, with uh, what the ambassador had to say here. Uh, obviously, uh, labeling issues, uh, tracking uh, exports, tracking imports of what China is doing, uh, and, and putting a focus on that. Obviously, there's resources at the Department of Commerce and USTR, uh, to, to be able to identify these issues and work with the Department of Agriculture to make sure we are uh, ensuring that China is not cheating on this matter and that we can build resources to produce it here. Thank you. Mr. Gackle, did you have anything to add? Yes, thank you. Uh, just briefly, and very good question, I'll maybe give a specific example of back home in North Dakota and talk about value added. and. Uh, Soybean, U.S. Soy, American Soybean Association, uh, working very hard on finding new domestic uses for what we grow, knowing that 
as was mentioned earlier, we're not going to we're not going to stop growing soybeans, and we're we're getting more efficient and better at uh, growing a growing a big crop. Um, so finding those new uses and new demand in North Dakota, we have uh, one new uh, soybean crush plant that's come online. Um, so there's opportunity there for the the oil and the renewable diesel. But a side product of that, and not a small side product, a, a big byproduct of that is the new meal opportunities that we're going to have. And when Ambassador Tom talks about uh, um, value added and those types of opportunities with the new meal that may be available through additional crush plants throughout the country, I think just a great opportunity there to add value to our domestic uh, ag value chain. Thank you. So obviously China is notorious for its violations of international labor standards, including in the ag sector. For instance, in 2021, the U.S. banned imports of cotton and tomatoes produced in the Xinjiang province due to strong evidence of forced labor practices. Beyond their labor practices, China, as we've heard today, also engages in IP theft, cyber attacks to, in order to steal data and have increased their ownership of foreign agricultural land, including here in the U.S. However, as a member of the Congressional Executive Committee on China, I'm focused on both calling out and combating China's bad behavior while also acknowledging that our trade relationship is critical to the American economy, particularly the ag sector. In 2022, for instance, Oregon exported over $300 million of agricultural products to China. I also consistently hear from constituents about the importance of the market access and foreign market development programs and the importance of exports to our overall ag um, economy cannot be understated. So again, for the whole panel, um, we as members of Congress think about our trade relationship with China. How can we balance the hard economic realities um, that our constituents face while also combating the Chinese governance, uh, government's egregious behavior? I see time is running short, but quickly, I would just... Uh the more, uh, if there's targeted ways to address those situations to try and diminish the uh, uh, negative ramifications that come back, back on U.S. producers, um, I don't have any exact recommendations on what the, those would be, but um, maybe just a bit more strategic when it comes to uh, um, the uh, policies trying to approach those um, certainly important and real concerns about um, the situation in certain places in China. but targeted and more strategic, but I'm sure others have better detail on that. Thank you. Yeah, quickly, uh, strategic surgical actions uh, in, in trade relations. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, sometimes when you go with big actions, you have big responses, but if you do them surgically, uh, uh, according to U.S. laws or building out on the right laws, um, it's understandable by the counterpart, and usually you don't have a big splash. The only thing I'll add is, you know, it's just been a number of years, a few years ago, that uh, China had, uh, or we had a trade imbalance of China. They had uh, over $500 billion worth of sales to the United States, and we only had $350 billion to China. We've got to find a way to figure that out, how we can increase our sales to China or find other sources for some of the products we're buying from China today. We've got to balance it. That's right. Thank you all. I yell back. Generally, time expired. Now, uh, recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Alford, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Really appreciate that. I don't have to tell you that China has its tentacles in everything we do. They are poisoning the minds of our young people with TikTok. They are poisoning their bodies, wiping out almost an entire generation of young people, killing 100,000 of our fellow citizens each year through fentanyl. I also sit on the House Armed Services Committee, and I represent two very distinguished bases, including Fort Leonard Wood, but also Whiteman Air Force Base, home of the B-2 Stealth Bomber and soon to be home of the B-21. We're concentrating on being an effective deterrent against the CCP and the PLA. You know, there are some generals who are openly saying that we could be at war with China by 2027. That's three years. We're trying to get ready for any potential conflict I believe that we have to do everything we can to keep our country safe from China's influence and espionage, and agriculture is a critical, critical part of the conversation. Our food security is national security. We have to be prepared for what could be coming. You know, in 2022, it was the last report shown China owned 383,935,000 ,930 acres in the United States of America, and yet you cannot go there and buy land. Recently, we introduced the American Land and Property Protection Act to protect Americans and our land 
from ownership by four adversary nations, including China, Iran, Russia, Venezuela, North Korea, Cuba. They shouldn't even be able to buy an outhouse in the United States of America, as far as I'm concerned. So, Mr. Daly, why is it important that we protect our property here in America from the Chinese Communist Party that wants to replace us as a world power? Thank you, Mr. Congressman. An excellent question. It's the point of the spear question in terms of what we're dealing and having to address in terms of the Chinese Communist Party and how they've effectuated laws, uh, recent laws over the last couple years that have effectively weaponized private companies, private Chinese companies, and put their private citizens under obligations to report and do what the state wants. So that becomes the issue before this committee and you as leaders of this country. What should we allow? Uh, given that China has pretty much uh, put in place a system and laws that make and weaponize their companies and put their individual citizens in a position they have to uh, do what the state asks them to do. Well, I think it's time to circle the wagons. Look, we can uh, halfway do this. Our, our governor uh, had an executive order uh, last year prohibiting any land sales within 10 miles of a military base. I mean, that's a good start. But I, I'm the firm belief we, Chinese communists should not be able to buy property in America, case closed. And it may hurt us on trade. I know, uh, sir, uh, Ambassador, you, you just mentioned that we need to increase our, our trade with China. This may hurt our trade. But we've got to protect America. Mr. Gackle, what, what contingency plans, say we are at war with China over Taiwan uh, in the next four to five years, what, what contingency plan do, do producers have, soybean producers have, uh, to protect the investments in our producers here in America? Thank you for the question, Congressman, and uh, provided some highlights earlier in oral and written testimony. Um, we learned from the uh, 2018 tariffs and retaliatory actions from China just how much uh, that type of situation can affect our bottom line on the farm. Um, and as I mentioned before, looking to diversify and grow new markets, understanding that there are risks there when you rely so heavily on one particular market or country. Uh, the scale of China being so large makes that risk even greater. And so I think that's why you're seeing more, you're seeing more farmer dollars invested in finding these new markets, um, finding new exports. And as I talked about, uh, as another contingency is just more domestic demand and more domestic uses for what we are growing here. Um, but again, we may continue to outproduce that demand, even if we find new you know, uh, on-takers for renewable diesel or the meal that I talked about. So we're going to have to go, we're going to have to do both. Well, both I just want to close. I appreciate you being here. This is a very serious matter, and I think most Americans are asleep when it comes to the threat from communist China. And I'm here to tell you now. The big bad wolf is at the door, and we better make sure that our house is made of brick and not straw. It's going to get blown in, and it's not going to be a pretty picture. Thank you so much for being here, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Now please recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and to the witnesses who are here today. Thank you so much for being with us today. As other members have highlighted today, agriculture is a very trade-dependent industry, and China is a top trading partner. How would you prioritize the most practical safeguards that can be put in, into place that will allow the U.S. agriculture community to export to China and not have markets and prices manipulated by their government or trade wars causing farmers to be the ones bearing the brunt of decisions? Just trying to prioritize. Yeah, when I think about, uh, you know, you're from the state of North Carolina, a major, major pork producer. That's right. Uh, I think whether it's pork or whether it's beef or whether it's the grains we produce on our farms back in the Midwest, there is no doubt we know our government conducts war games to understand what happens when China inevitably takes back Taiwan. We need to do the same as producers, as an industry, to make sure how do we react? How do we, how do we prepare before this actually happens? Because it's going to happen. He's, he's made comments that it's going to happen. So let's prepare now. Let's not wait for it. Uh, in terms of prioritization, again, we have to continue to grow our sales around the world, diversify, continue to sell to China. But again, I think it's, it's time we balance that trade out. 
Yeah, I agree with the ambassador. There's a, already a number of companies, major U.S. companies, that are consulting with uh, experts and, and technicians to understand what the ramifications are if we have a, you know, a hot war issue with China in terms of, of uh, their, their, their processes of, of sales globally, in terms of how their uh, supply chains deal with it as well. So I think companies are going that way, and I think the government needs uh, itself in the ag space to really focus in on this. And I think uh, members here today uh, and yourself have made this a big focus in terms of what should be the priorities. And, and, and I think this is an exercise where the ag department has to work with industry and you all to make sure those priorities are in line with, with uh, uh, U.S. national and economic security and food security. Super. Uh, maybe to touch on something just a little separate, but in line with those things. Uh, so looking at profitability for farmers and what we're trying to manage as risk, um, I think a priority area and something we haven't talked about much is just sending or getting the policy right in D.C., whether it's uh, here in Congress or through the administration, on um, incentives for further domestic growth, um, incentives for uh, Sustainable aviation fuel, that's one idea we haven't talked much about, but getting that policy right as it's getting developed and trying to get off the ground could be a potentially huge market there for U.S. producers. Um, so it's, and then maybe in the regulatory as well, um, trying to find ways to uh, ease the regulatory burden on producers, and streamlining whether it's uh, EPA issues or other U or federal agencies when it comes to regulatory types of issues. But getting that policy right as well provides a little more predictability um, and uh, certainty for U.S. producers. Okay, thank you. Uh, U.S. agriculture is the cream of the crop when it comes to productivity, innovation, and producing agriculture uh, further ahead into the 21st century using new technology. Um, China is not only interested in, in these innovations, but in the past, operatives have been caught trying to smuggle them out of the country. Um, my question here, is there any way to evaluate or ensure that our investments in emerging agriculture technology are not being exploited by China uh, for their own advantage? Uh, thank you, Congressman. That's a great question, and it's, it's, it's right on the forefront. Uh, we have to be vigilant uh, in terms of uh, having our intelligence agencies work with the Department of Agriculture to give and provide that intelligence information that's going to be able to spot, identify where the threat's going to emanate and be able to capture it before it occurs. So that's a, that's a big part of this equation. The second part of this equation is, I think, making sure we get our cybersecurity systems uh, in line with, uh, with the agricultural producers. That means making sure we get uh, a wrap on the technologies that are out there, Internet of Thing technologies that China is uh, controlling the market on. We need to make sure we friend shore that or produce it here in the United States. Yeah. You know, a nation's power is usually predicated upon four key pillars. One is diplomatic uh, presence around the world to get involved in any, any other country that we need to be involved with before a crisis happens. Two is economic, three is military, but fourth is informational. And I think we need to make sure that we're tapping in and collaborating across agencies, USDA, CIA, FBI, everybody, that we're having the best information to make sure we understand what's going on and what China is doing behind the scenes that we're not monitoring today. You know, it's one thing as an agriculture industry, we tend to trust everybody. Farmers are the best at helping somebody when their barn blows down. They go together and they, they don't worry about getting any financial support to do that. They go together and work. We trust people. We do things together, but I think we've let our guard down in guarding our intellectual property. Now it's got to come up, and we've got to, we need any support we can get from you. Thank yeah. you. Well, thank you so much. It sounds easy. We have a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. We yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, now I'm going to recognize myself for five minutes. I just happened to jump in the right spot at the right time. So um, um, isn't that slick? But... It's correct according to the roster. Don't get mad, guys, anyway. So uh, thank you. Th uh, thanks to our panelists. I apologize for being in and out of the room. There's three committees at the same time today. So um, let me uh, jump to uh, Am Ambassador Tom. Uh, and again, forgive me if this is redundant from previous questioning here, but uh, that's one, what I have is that... Uh, we saw 
Over 10 years ago, one of the largest Chinese acquisitions of American company was Smithfield. Um, it really, I think, brought the focus of uh, China and what it means as really a danger to American agriculture and to the American food supply as more and more of this proliferates. And really little has been done to put the brakes on that. So uh, with the Chinese government plan to buy up more and more farmland, not just for the sake of farmland, but we see a, a lot with uh, the uh, adjacent lands to many of our military bases and other important installations. So um, bring that into focus on what that means for our U.S. producers if these facilities, such as uh, you know processing plants, are more and more owned by Chinese or other outside influences like that. What, what's that going to do to um, um, perhaps harm the ability for them to have a place to take their product and have it processed and marketed for them through the, through the, cha through the chains that we're kind of used to these days? So, Ambassador. Yeah, the, the comment I would make there is an example, Smithfield. Uh, granted, uh, producers across the United States are benefiting from that relationship. They have a place to go with their pork to be processed, to be moved around the United States and be exported. The reality is we have to understand why the Chinese bought Smithfield Foods. It wasn't necessarily for the production capacity as it was for the intellectual property. We know that every pork producer in, in China was, every family had two pigs out back and they fed them their schwill and their leftovers and excess. But that's when they got Afri African swine fever that occurred across the nation. And, and so they knew that they needed to consolidate, be more structured in the manner, make sure they brought in the latest science to protect their pork herd, but more importantly, their own food security. So again, the only way they could get this was to acquire a company like Smithfield to acquire their intellectual property. Thank you, appreciate that. Uh, I want to shift to Mr. Daly in my remaining time here on, um, with the Chinese uh, cartel work going on so much uh, in the drug culture, and I have so much of it going on in Northern California, almost almost uncontrolled. The, the locals are seem almost powerless and short on resources to battle against the vast proliferation of uh, Chinese cartel marijuana grows. And you, you should see it, the, the vast numbers of uh, greenhouses that have been put up on. A lot of cases right now it's private property, which makes it a different enforcement. In different areas it's been on federal lands, which federal lands have been slow to be enforced on with you know Forest Service or whatever, not making the moves. but. When it's owned property, it it's provides its own um, challenges on that. So um, we have uh, much organized crime tied tied to China uh, and dominating much of the illicit marijuana trade. And it, it's horrific for the environment, horrific for local uh, law enforcement, and just a sense of security for the neighbors there. Even so much as the amount of water being carted by these four thousand gallon trucks to these grows without permits, without county ordinances in, in their favor, environmental damage. So uh, these Chinese gangs have been uh, distributing the end product, but also very dangerous chemicals that are not available at all to American farmers in the process. So can, Mr. Daly, can you emphasize a little bit, uh, what would you tell us about the international crime effects and overall effect on our national security as well as the local quality of life in communities like this. This is, I'm talking about Siskiyou County in Northern California, but there's been other ones in neighboring Trinity County. Again, that's been more on federal lands. Please uh, touch on that, would, would you? Thank you, Congressman. That's uh, an excellent point and obviously a very serious issue that um, Thankfully, with your leadership, the, the, the focus, uh, the U.S. focus uh, gets placed upon it. I think uh, the resources we have just need to be uh, uh, born on it. Obviously, uh, the customs, uh, CBP, in terms of its uh, seeing what's happening on the borders to be able to address that. And then obviously uh, getting uh, our Justice Department to make sure that they prioritize this issue in, in terms of going after these cartels uh, are two uh, 
possible uh, ways we can you can uh, draw focus on that uh, in in your role as congressman. Thank you. Yeah, there, there's been a either inaction, disinterest, or reluctance by federal and state agencies to really come in and enforce hard on this when you know it's violating local laws, local ordinances. So, well, I need to yield. So, uh, with that, I would uh, like to now recognize the. Uh, <clears throat> the Wahine from Hawaii <laughs> for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as the only Asian American member of the House Agriculture Committee and as a member of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, I want to remind um, my colleagues on this committee that words matter. And even as we deliberate, we must consider the unintended consequences and impacts of our words and policy decisions on our Asian American community. You know, I also serve on the House Armed Services Committee, and my district is on the front lines of defense in the Indo-Pacific, so I deeply understand the risks with the CCP and it's the threat it has to global security, national security. That being said, irresponsible and inflammatory rhetoric will encourage and invite xenophobic and discrimination um, against Chinese Americans and those to be perceived to be Chinese. You know, Governor Noam said that we've become a country addicted to being offended by each other. But there are too many examples in the recent past of rhetoric leading to violence against Asian Americans. One is only to remember Vincent Chin, a Chinese American from Michigan who was murdered at the height of the anti-Japanese sentiment in this country because of his perceived race. Congress passed the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act in 2021 because of dramatic increases in anti-Asian hate crimes and violence during the COVID-19 pandemic. The way we discuss this policy will and has consequences. Uh, it's also important to remember that alien land laws are rooted in racism. The enactment of the Chinese Exclusion Act and official state policies were designed to prevent Chinese individuals from owning land and property. During World War II, Japanese immigrants and Japanese Americans, including my great-grandfather, were incarcerated en masse because of their race. They were also subjected to exclusionary alien land laws in different states and were forced to sell their properties during incarceration. I'm glad that Ranking Member Krishnamurthy highlighted the importance of the cure not being worse than the disease. We must not stand for laws that discriminate based on ethnicity and nationality. Before proposing broad bans that could have significant impacts on Asian Americans and our immigrants, um, there's a lot more we can do to invest in data collection and reporting on foreign ownership of land, including agriculture land, and appreciate your indulgence and patience. I know you've gone through various rounds of these types of questions. Uh, I'm not saying that we should not have this discussion, but let's make sure that the policies passed by this committee are grounded in fact, not fear. I welcome my colleagues to work with me and my colleagues on KPAC to come together on policies that will combat the CCP while protecting our Chinese American and immigrant communities. The recently passed appropriations bill will give the United States Secretary of Agriculture a seat on CFIUS. How will this impact USDA's ability to monitor Chinese investment in the United States? And are there any changes to CFIUS that would help us better address the issue of foreign agriculture land purchases? To whomever might wanna answer that question. Thank you, Congressman. Those are uh, excellent points, and and uh, and and should be taken to heart and seriously with every every uh, everyone in in governance and everyone uh, in a leadership position to make sure we uh, say and do the right thing. The issue is the ch state of China, period. So, in terms of the, uh, your question um, uh, and, and the reporting, you know, having agriculture there at the table with Civius will definitely give it a focus. Obviously, they're going to build capacity at the Department of Agriculture. Uh, as, uh, uh, as members of CFIUS. They're gonna build it internally to be able to be more responsive uh, to uh, how CFIUS thinks. And that's gonna give them expertise to be able to know what they need to do in terms of finding the information to provide it to CFIUS mm -hmm. to be able to address the investment issues that carry national security problems. Anyone else wanna answer that? Okay. All right. If not, um, the USDA, I know, has requested funding to develop a real-time data system that can be accessed by other U.S. government agencies and the public. Are there any particular privacy concerns for such a system that we need to be thinking about preparing for as well? Could you repeat the question? The USDA has requested funding to develop a real-time data system that can be accessed by other U.S. government agencies and the public. Are there any privacy concerns um, for such a system? Do we need to build in any kind of safeguards? Are there issues? Most of that's public anyway, so I don't see any problem there. Okay. All right. I know my time is drawing to a close, and I did want to get to some research questions. I may have further questions to enter the record. 
Mr. Chair, but according to estimates from USDA's Economic Research Service, China's annual public investment in agriculture research surpassed U.S. investment in this area as of 20, 2008, and China has continued to move past us in the years that have followed. What investments in research should we be making in the Farm Bill to remain competitive globally? You know, again, I'm on the Armed Services Committee. If China truly is our pacing threat, not just on a defense scale, but also on a food production scale, then what more do we be, need to be doing since clearly they are investing and we are not to that level? Uh, thank you for the question, Congresswoman. Uh, from, again, the producer standpoint and speaking with American Soybean Association, uh, we are strong advocates for any type of increased research money, whether it's uh, at the federal level or at the state level with our, with our universities and extension offices. That research, uh, there's a strong history of that research leading to improved products for me as a grower, um, increased confidence that I'll be able to produce a, produce a crop under challenging circumstances, whether it's uh, weather or um, other type of you know, pests, any type of the risk that we're seeing on the farm when it comes to actually growing a crop. So those dollars, again, whether federal or at the state level, um, very important. Thank you. I know my time is up, Chair, but clearly if they are our pacing threat, then we need to invest as like to be able to keep up. Thank you. The Wahine from Hawaii yields back. Okay. The, the cane from Kansas has got five minutes. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank Chairman Thompson for having today's hearing. I appreciate Governor Nome and our uh, members of the China Select Committee being here this morning, and thank uh, the three of you for all your time this afternoon as well. I represent the big first district of Kansas, uh, which is in uh, some now in eastern, mostly in central and western Kansas. We are the uh, number one producer of beef in the country, number one wheat, number one sorghum, host of other ag products as well. And we see every side of the uh, supply chain uh, in, in the Bigfoot District of Kansas. We also know in, in Kansas that food security is national security. And I tell people all the time, and to remind the committee, you know, we are the free country we are for a host of reasons, one of which is the fact that we've never had to rely on another country for our food supply, um, which is why the work of this committee is so incredibly important. Um, this hearing's highlighted the negative impact that foreign adversaries like China can have on that food and, ag and agriculture chain, and I share those concerns, including ownership of, of large tracts of farmland near our military installations. Any threat to our country has to be taken very seriously. Um, I'm chairman of the um, subcommittee on livestock, dairy, and poultry, and, and I would like to draw special attention to China's questionable ambitions with our country's livestock assets. China has made it clear that it desires America's protein products and is making substantial investments in both securing our protein and in emulating America's livestock genetics overseas. Um, question for you, Mr. Daly. Um, given China's track record of intellectual property theft, could China also be conducting espionage operations to acquire the very livestock genetics that American ranchers have spent decades developing rather than researching it and developing it themselves? And if so, what, ought what, what should we be thinking about in Congress um, to do about that? That's an excellent question, Congressman, and, and thank you for it. Um, I absolutely do think this is something that China would do. Um, uh, there's a reason why the, uh, the Committee on Foreign Investment, uh, one of the national security priorities was U.S. biological information, U.S. person biological information. And if that's something uh, China is uh, gathering for its intelligence, it's certainly uh, because food security uh, for China is imperative to, uh, to their survival. It's certainly something they're going to do. In terms of how we guard against it, uh, you know, uh, I think just being vigilant on seeing where they're putting their resources and, and where they're trying to steal that, tech, that, that information. Yeah, I, I agree. And I appreciate what you said, Ambassador Tom. You know, agriculture is very trusting. You know, our family farms, I can't imagine, you know, taking a piece of bailing wire from my neighbor, uh, much less stealing somebody's intellectual property, right? Um, that's just how we operate. But we cannot forget that that's not um, what we see from other actors uh, in the global markets that we participate in. Uh, trade is key. And we've got to continue to foster non-Chinese uh, markets to add resiliency, um, I believe, to the global export markets for our ag, our ag producers. You know, MAP and FMD, market access program and foreign market development, critical components to that. I've been an advocate of seeing us work towards doubling dollars we're spending on MAP and, and FMD. Question for you, uh, Mr. Gackle. Um, how can programs like MAP and FMD, in your view, help develop trade relationships with 
American allies and grow ag exports, particularly at a time when China remains such a large threat and when the Biden administration has not been pursuing new free trade agreements? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I start by saying that there is a strong track record and history of how those programs have worked in the past and the relationships that we've been able to build. Um, it, it, 112 markets across the country, I think, is what I mentioned earlier in my uh, both written and oral testimony. Um, and the return on investment, I've said this before too, but just to make the point again, these are not just MAP and FMD, federal government dollars, taxpayer dollars. These are also farmer invested dollars through our checkoff programs, um, whether it's soybeans or other commodity groups. So farmers are demonstrating their uh, willingness to participate in these programs by investing their own dollars. And we're seeing a tremendous return on those checkoff dollars when it comes back to the farm and return on investment there. So again, we have a history of showing how those relationships are built. And you know that takes time to build those relationships and establish them. And we just want to continue to be a reliable partner with those markets that we're working in. Yeah, incredibly important as we think about how we counter, counteract China. And, and lastly, for you, Ambassador Tom, I know we don't have much time here, um, but you know we, we've seen China's domestic ag production grow um, certainly 530% um, since the year 2000. How does China's increase in ag production impact our ag and food security in our country? Well, obviously, it displaces our market, right? I mean, I think we've seen nearly a 500-some percent increase in productivity across China over the past decade. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, comes from a lot of U.S. innovation that's been stolen from us. So we've lost that competitive edge. Now, I have no reason to believe that they won't continue to grow at a very rapid rate. Now, since they've got uh, a lot of our technology already, whether it's the digital side or whether it's the intellectual property on the genetic side or on the chemistry side, they're going to continue to grow that. So again, Xi Jinping wants to be a food secure nation to feed his 1.4 billion people and we need to be prepared to do what we can to grow our trade around the world. I want to say one final thing. The BRICS, when Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin walked out of the Kremlin a year ago in January, they said, who would have thought we would have had control of the world so quickly, hmm. going our direction? I think we need to take notice because the BRICS are trying to supplant the United States, and we're not aware of everything that's going on there. Wholeheartedly agree. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Duarte, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, the panel. Um, so I, I want to echo um, so much of what we've heard today in concerns with China and their competitiveness and their buying of our of our natural resources. But at this point, it might be echo, echo, echo. So I want to touch on a few other related matters that that threaten American working families. Uh, food access and, and our national food security. Um, currently, we're seeing produce crops. There were $4 billion in imports from Mexico in 2000. Today, there are about 20 million tons of produce crops coming in from Mexico. Uh, we know that the avocado industry and other fresh produce industries are being capitalized by the drug cartels. We know the drug cartels are enjoying our open border policy, partnering with China for fentanyl and, and other sources. We also know that Mexico is, is aligning itself politically, as is mo a great deal of um, Central and South America with China. Our produce industry is being recapitalized in Mexico, currently providing significant in imports to, to American consumers. I'm very concerned that those exports aren't always going to flow to American consumers. And once our produce industry is replaced, we'll have little little to say about it. Am, am I valid in that concern? I know. Kip, Ambassador, why don't you jump in? Pete, the last part of that question again. Is America subject to seeing its produce supply from Mexico diverted to China at any moment China decides they need that supply? You know, as I witnessed in, uh, in my time at Mission, uh, we see these BRIC nations line up oftentimes together and they'll do anything to cut the U.S. out of a supply chain and move in another direction. Anything they can affect us economically, they'll do it, but it could be a threat. It just depends on supply chains and getting air coal supply chains. Uh, my biggest risk is what I see in your home state of California of how you're moving agriculture out oftentimes, especially in the, the vegetable, the permanent crops. It's moving other places around the world. But my concern about products coming out of Mexico is are they produced with the chemicals or with the products that are approved in the United States? 
I'm not sure we track it all as well as we should. Yeah. The other, the other issue we have is here in the United States, I mean, we talk about intellectual property theft and how that hurts American companies in China, but we're losing intellectual property value here in America. We've, we've addressed it in this committee several times, the USDA. They're just not approving our advanced farm chemistries. We have companies spending enormous amounts of money developing new, new tools for us, and we can't get our own USDA to approve them. Meanwhile, the patents tick away and these crop protection companies lose their incentives to invest in American farm tools in the future. Am, am, am I on track there? If you look on the crop care side, it's been almost 40 years since we've had a new mode of action come into the marketplace. That just shows how slow it is. It takes 18 years to bring a new chemistry to the market and hundreds of millions of dollars to get it there. Um, I don't know if it's a, a funding issue or no, they, personnel issue. I think it's just incompetence and disinterest in approving farm chemical tools. Another question, I just came from a natural re resources hearing I stepped out to about offshore oil drilling. We're not exploring oil in America. We're not building our electric grid. We're focusing trillions towards green energy boondoggles, in my opinion. If, if you were advising an ag chem company to put in a major ag chemical or fertilizer plant, or pharmaceutical for that matter, or any kind of chemical precursors, would you in in good conscience, advise them to build that plant in America today, given our energy policies. Well, as a producer, I want them here. But when I know our energy policy that's under this current administration, no. And this is a 20-year plant. So a friendly administration may or may not sway a 20-year investment, maybe a 50-year investment. So. You know, I, I can't tell you what their investment thesis is, but I, I know this. It's very capital intense to bring these plants back to the United States. But again, whether it's here or to our allies, we need to work together to do this. So as, as China's growing its carbon economy, we hear about the coal plants, we know about the oil, we know about the rest of the world drilling oil. And America's choosing not to have a carbon economy. Our working families are struggling. We've got cereal companies advertising breakfast cereal for dinner now. Um, is our biggest problem China? Or our own policies, the biggest problem for American consumers today? Sir, it's our own policies. And whether it's energy or whether it's food, and what we're doing in the regulatory environment, what we're trying to do, whether it's trying to solve climate, as some people say we're doing, or what we're trying to do in nutrition, this is going to affect those that can least afford it the most. I know we have people who are coming out trying to sell climate programs to us. That they say, well, if they're going to absorb it. It gets handed on to the consumer. Same goes with this energy policy. It's going to get handed on to the consumer. So while China's upper middle class is growing and their, their disposable income is growing, the purchase power, power, purchase power parity is already bigger than the American working families. Um, we're not, they're not eating our lunch because they're buying our land. They're eating our lunch because we're feeding it to them. Thank you very much. I yield back. The almost time expired, and I'll recognize Mr. Nunn for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and I uh, appreciate this panel hanging with us throughout this day. This is a very important conversation for all of us. Look, as a former counterintelligence officer, someone who served on the NSC uh, as well, I want to say the threat is real and it's often overlooked in the ag community. I appreciate the chairman putting this together and having a discussion on the direct impact. I just got off the China Commission where we talked about harvesting organs that China's trying to sell around the world. Harvesting our own agriculture and the threat that that poses is direct, it's real, and it's now. Mr. Gagne, thank you first and foremost for what you do with the Soybean Association. Um, you are part of a team of tireless workers who are in the field producing and providing for not just America, but the entire country. Iowa, Illinois, others, we all are part of this team together. And so I'm proud of what we've been able to export uh, with the U.S. agriculture being soybeans number one in the field for our ag exports. The challenge is 60 percent of that is going to China today. Talk to us a little bit about what we should be doing here in Congress to help diversify that and ensure that we're not dependent on a sole customer that could use this in a trade war against us. Well, I talked about it. Thank you for the question, first of all. Um, appreciate you highlighting uh, that, that important part of it as well and what we are doing as U.S. farmers to supply the world. Um, but you're right. With that uh, reliance, so much of that reliance on China, finding these new markets is critical. Um, we have talked about MAP and FMD. Uh, something I haven't mentioned yet is the new program um, from USDA under the Regional Agriculture Promotion Program, um, which is uh, 
is looking at markets in new and developing places, places that aren't traditionally reliant on MAP and FMD. Um, so uh, SOI has applied for grants in that area as well. I think Congress continuing to value and realize um, the return on investment that we get from the MAP and FMD dollars. Right. I mean, it, it sounds like a lot of money when we ask for doubling of market access programs and an increase to foreign market development. Um, but the need is there. Um, the program has proven throughout the years that uh, there is not enough funds there to meet the demand. Um, we could always we could always use more in building those new markets. So when we look at you know possible challenges to the China market, uh, depending on policy decisions here in the U.S., it's just important to keep those resources there and to increase them and bring that return back to farmers. And it's not just our markets that we're able to sell to overseas. We've got real competition on the horizon right now. I mean, when we look at Brazil, which has been enabled with Chinese investment, they're now the lead producer of soybeans. This is a threat that we're going to be competing with others who are subsidizing their market to go after these same markets. Is that correct? That's correct. And, uh, you know, I, some, some may have been to Brazil. Uh, if you've ever had a chance to visit there, you can just see the tremendous opportunity they have to continue to increase their production, both through uh, just putting more acres or hectares into production um, and adding new land to that. But also, they're increasing their yield. They're spending on money on research as well, which is something we spoke about earlier. So they're getting better at what they're doing. There are improvements to their infrastructure, whether it's highways or ports or rails. So they are making all the, all the improvements that are going to put them in a better position around the world. So competing with yeah. that is crucial. I'd like to turn to you on the national security side. Uh, look, we've looked at a number of things in this committee today about what we're doing in the state of Iowa. One, to stop China from buying farmland in the United States. It was highlighted with my friend Mr. Feenstra here. We're literally seeing people take the genetic material and replicate it in China by taking it from a farm field. This is happening in small business across the area. The Chinese government, as we learned today, has worked diligently to start mapping the DNA of humans within their country it's fair to say they're coming after agriculture, whether it's grown in a field or grown in a barn. Would you agree? I absolutely agree. Uh, China is uh, uh, in, in the world of biologics. That's where they know the next, uh, next uh, round of technology goes, and especially big data and having uh, artificial intelligence to pull it together and then innovate or try to innovate or steal innovation from us uh, and leapfrog us, whether that's human biology or uh, in the agricultural space. I'm proud that we've been able to work together on the Protect Small Business and Prevent Illicit Financing Act, which I led to be able to pass, as well as what we're doing in the Cybersecurity and Agricultural Act. I want to highlight, you know, with your work in the CFIUS, is there advantage from being able to really look at creating regional agricultural cybersecurity realms uh, at our land grant and region schools, like Iowa State, on areas that can be really helpful? Because we now know that the top three sectors under attack, financial services, energy, and ag. The threat's real. Absolutely. I think the expansion of our cybersecurity capabilities and knowledge is, like, imperative. Just, I mean, China has uh, built up in its military and divisions uh, a cybersecurity warfare division that is constantly going at U.S. businesses. And given the prioritization of the three uh, industries you mentioned, I mean, ag is where they're going. And they're going to do it, and they're going to put all the resources into it. And so we have to counter it. And these, uh, that partnership that you've talked about, sort of building out that expertise, is imperative. I really appreciate that. Uh, I yield back the remainder of my time. Thank you, gentlemen. The gentleman's time expired. Now I recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Thank Van, you. Van Orden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is incredibly painful for me to compliment my friend from California due to his unreasonable advocacy for almond milk, but I, I feel <laughs> that I must at this point. I want to reiterate his question and, and Mr. Tom's answer. Due to the Biden administration's war on energy, it would not be prudent for companies to start working on plants to provide nutrients and pest control agents in the United States right now. I don't think people quite understand what that means. Mr. Toms, thank you for, Tom, thank you for pointing that out. We have to stay ahead of China, and the Biden administration can't get out of their own way. So that is incredibly important. I just want to make sure we didn't skip over that. Um, so I also want to compliment the Biden administration for doing something that is absolutely amazing, that um, they've pulled off a foreign policy miracle and that they've driven China and Russia closer together since the death of Stalin. That's, it sounds like a joke, but I'm not being trite. Uh, that is exactly what the Biden administration has done by their horrible policy, foreign policy decision-making stuff. So I just want to ask a couple things about 
beans, if that's okay, because they're very important. And um, so we produce a lot in the third congressional district of the state of Wisconsin and also corn. And I read your, all your guys' testimony in detail. Thank you so much for it. And I just have a question because, in fact, Brazil is eating our lunch because we're, we're feeding it to them. Another good line from Duarte. Today's a good day for you, Duarte. Um, so we had this huge problem when the previous administration did uh, trade, uh, trade sanctions. It was like 27% or whatever the heck it was. But we've recovered since that. Right? So now you're selling roughly the same amount of beans to China that you did before, even though Brazil has increased their capacity. There's a couple questions. Um, if we had stuck with it, would that still be the case? Meaning, would China finally have come around and started to work with the United States because we stood firm for longer than one administration, from, in your opinion, sir? Yeah, thank you for the question. And yeah, not being a foreign policy expert, I might not have all the right answers here, but... I think, under, so part of the recovery with that market was the phase one agreement that the U.S. and China entered into to get back some of that market. Right. Um, what we're seeing, though, is there's really no enforcement mechanism to that, um, unfortunately. So my, I would say we haven't seen a full recovery <coughs> in that China market since 2018. Yep. Um, appreciate that a lot of it has come back under that agreement, but some of this long-term, what I call long-term damage to the U.S. reliability, I mean, we have historically been viewed as reliable suppliers around the world. And part of the, uh, part of the negative part of the 2018 tariff deal that we might not get back is that, that full confidence that foreign markets across the world had in U.S. as a reliable provider. And you know what? I, you can see that as a negative or a net positive. I see it as a net positive because the United States uh, needs to be uh, viewed as someone that's going to stand with democracy and freedom. And uh, Xi Jinping, you know, they've had multiple... Uh, famines, as you pointed out in the last century, and quite frankly, they don't care. Um, the Soviet Union, they murdered essentially millions of people by starving them to death when they did collectivization, so I get it, and the Great Leap Forward during the Cultural Revolution is what you're referring to. So let me ask you this question. Do we as American farmers have more resiliency built into our systems because we are getting back to where we were? Do we have more resiliency built into our systems than Brazil has the potential to expand their capacity? And can we wait China out? China has, has to feed their people every day. Mm -hmm. So do we have the resiliency built into our systems that if we actually stuck to our guns like President Trump did and not fold the cards like President Biden did, if we stood strong, are we going to be able to maintain our industry? That is tough to predict, sir. Um, I'll start by saying that farmers across the country um, absolutely understand the critical issues that you're talking about here yep. when it comes to China and China competitiveness. and threats posed to American agriculture. So that's, that's appreciated by growers. I, I believe that's the case, speaking for myself at least, and I'm sure others. Uh, to say that we have the entire resiliency, I, I mean, one thing I'll mention, we haven't really talked about, the outlook uh, for farm income over the next two to five years is not great. It is. Prices are dropping, Input the cost of inputs, you know, may not be as increasing as fast as they are, but our cost of production is generally going up. So Mr. Gackle, profitability is coming down. Mr. Gackle, I'm sorry, I only have 20 seconds left. Sorry. I appreciate it completely. And we're not going to get inputs down until fuel cost goes down because everything's predicated on diesel fuel. You know that. It's got to get in the ground. It's got to get out. And one question for you, Mr. Tom. Um, if you could go back in time, do you think the United States of America should be feeding uh, Nazi Germany in 1938 before their invasion of Poland in 1939? Should we be providing them with food? and aid well and, and bringing it up to you want to talk about china today on that or well you want I, to talk about nazi i want germany to highlight and, the fact that right now we are essentially feeding nazi germany in 1938 and do you think that that's an appropriate use of american resources would it have been then and is it now with china because that's where we're at with china we're in 1938. They i want to sell they haven't much. invaded poland yet but it's on the horizon. I want to sell as much as we can. We know the demand for protein around the world is continuing to grow at a rapid rate, whether it's India, China, or throughout the developing world in Africa and the Middle East. The reality is we are the best suited to, to meet that demand. But again, it's trade for the United States. It's something we can sell and we need to bring it back home. But again, we're not going to maintain that competitive edge unless we start protecting our Mr. own Mr. Tom, I, I understand my, my time has expired. I just want to tell you that if I had the choice to sell food and give aid to Hitler in 1938, I would not have done so. Uh, with that, I yield back. 
Not much time expired. I'm going to take the liberty here as we close out to recognize myself for uh, for five minutes. We votes have been called uh, probably about eight nine minutes ago, so we've uh, got a fair amount of time left <laughs> um, on the clock, and even after that clock it winds up. Uh, so one quick question, Mr. Alley, your testimony highlights the recent GAO report and the issues U USDA faces with uh, with AFIDA. Uh, you also mentioned that foreign agriculture land holdings within the United States have increased 30 percent since 2019. Outside of the recommendations within the report, can you expand on other changes Congress should look to uh, to address the gaps? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's a very good question. I, I think, you know, in terms of the reporting that's being done, I think what's interesting to me and what I've seen in, in, in government and in the private sector in terms of the way China's doing some of its investments, it's doing it in very complex ways, either through private equity entities where there are limited partners versus being general partners. So I think capturing that complexity of that reporting in terms of ownership would be very useful and also in terms of land use. But I think the recommendations of the GAO uh, are useful uh, as a starting play, place, but looking at how the Chinese are structuring that investment and where they're doing it uh, in directions that can't be caught is important, and where they're declaring their uh, 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 ownership in the other land category should be examined. Well, before I yield back uh, my time, I'd, I'd like to address the gentleman from Massachusetts' comments. Uh, we're all aware of California's oppressive Proposition 12 mandate, as well as similar mandates from states like Massachusetts. And I'm sure you all have also heard me say that I want to fix uh, for these mandates. Uh, while my colleague may think this is a done deal, the Supreme Court made it abundantly clear that Congress can, and quite frankly, my reading of the opinions, should uh, uh, address this. Uh, we do have a farm bill that's uh, coming up here, hopefully in the very near future. Um, it is, and because of the communications that the Supreme Court did in their opinions, they made it that abundantly clear that, that Congress has the ability to address the interstate chaos, commerce chaos that we have seen arise since they're rolling. Now, I'm a strong supporter of states' rights, and I acknowledge that sometimes state laws can have limited uh, extraterritorial effects. But any state or local laws that control production outside of their jurisdictions are inherently harmful to interstate commerce. Uh, the EATS Act and similar proposed fixes would not restrict states from creating laws for their residents. It would just ensure that American farmers outside of those jurisdictions would continue to be allowed to produce according to the standards of the state that they produce in. Any other characterization of what these proposals would do is false and misleading, and is quite frankly a stain on this committee's work. And to specifically address the comments related to China, no one has made any sort of coherent argument explaining how one state dictating to another uh, how to farm helps out China. Uh, China didn't ask for the help, Farmers have, farmers have asked for the help. And while my colleague from Massachusetts was uh, ranting about China's influence on my decision making, my staff at that point were meeting with over 30 American pork producers who all asked for a Prop 12 fix in order to continue running their family owned operations. Now, I'm trying to have a serious policy conversations while some of my colleagues are standing behind a convenient straw man instead of coming to the table and finding a solutions. I've committed to finding a fix that benefits American producers and no one else, and, uh, and I tend to find one. Um, that concludes my questions and um, uh, closing statements. Um, you know, just uh, thank you so much to, uh, uh, to our witnesses. Uh, just a wealth of information that you have uh, shared with us. I think it's insightful, it's helpful, very specific thoughts and recommendations that we need to be pursuing. Um, as always, thank you to our staff, uh, that really uh, our personal office staffs, our committee staffs that do, do such great work to, to, to help make sure that we do this, these types of hearings successfully. Food security is national security. And food production acreage and food processing that is influenced through the purchase or theft of intellectual property by the, by influenced by the Chinese Communist government 
is a significant risk. Um, there must be legal consequences that serve as a deterrent and a preventative measure. And we've, we've heard many, I think, really solid recommendations today uh, to, uh, th that we need to continue to build on. So, uh, safeguards are warranted. Uh, even outside of this committee, I'm very proud to, um, within the education workforce space, we have uh, uh, have proposed a, a bill, introduced a bill that would create a pilot for incorporating cybersecurity into career and technical education. Uh, we want, we need people with those skills to be on the front line. You know, we talked about the massive data of agriculture, and those systems need people that are working on the, in the development and the maintenance of those who have great cybersecurity skills. So there's a uh, there's a broad uh, width of uh, of uh, solutions here that and, and and certainly having people with the right skills to uh, to do our best to be able to prevent that the stealing of intellectual property. Um, that's just one one small example. So we need to encourage USDA to aggressively work on, uh, I believe as well in this space, uh, we need to encourage USDA to aggressively work on new trade agreements uh, in, in uh, new markets uh, for our agriculture commodities to manage future risk. We must strengthen our investment in agri both agriculture research and quite frankly, their trade programs, uh, foreign market development, in our market access program. Um, we, we need to encourage, I believe, trade language for USTR to be able to be equipped with um, that would prevent, uh, do our best to prevent retaliatory in, in the in trade agreements, uh, 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 retaliatory tariffs on American agriculture commodities. Because anytime there's a trade war, uh, the low-hanging fruit, so to speak, is American agriculture. I remember first coming here under the Obama administration, there was a problem with, I believe it was uh, Chinese manufactured tires. They were creating some type of, of um, accident risk. I don't remember what it was specifically. So we imposed a tariff on these tires, or the Obama administration did. And in response, China put a tariff on our chickens, ducks, and turkeys. Um, I, I, I think it's immoral. Uh, that any country, including the United States, would would do retaliatory tariffs on such an essential thing as food. And we, we ought to look at language that somehow we, we could at least promote within the trade discussions. Uh, when, and I will say, when the tariff disputes are completely on or related to agriculture. So once again, uh, to our witnesses here today, uh, thank you so much uh, for your service, uh, for your expertise, and for joining us here. And uh, uh, the uh, under the rules of the committee, the record of today's hearing will remain open for 10 calendar days to receive additional material and supplementary written responses from the witnesses to any questions posed by a member. This hearing of the Committee on Agriculture is adjourned. <laughs>